Welcome everybody to a brand new Blu-ray and DVD out and about video today and this week's season release of Candyman. Candyman. Candy. Nope. Not gonna do it. No. <laughs> Hitting store shelves along with the Disney action adventure extravaganza Jungle Cruise, the dramatic biopic The Eyes of Tammy Faye, and Blue Underground is releasing the call classic sequels Maniac Cop 2 and 3 in all that 4K glory, plus much, much more. So let's go see the deals, exclusives, and we are at our first location, Walmart. So let's go in and see what they got. All right, everybody, we are in at Walmart, and last week we were pretty damn lucky with all that new release love. This week, we've seen better days. <laughs> Indeed we have, man. I mean, they're not completely devoid of all the new release love, but it's pretty damn close, but I'll take at least one new release because in the past, we've got Diddly Squad. So something, especially when it comes to this Walmart, is definitely better than nothing. I will take it when we have... Candyman, the 4K Blu-ray digital for $27.96. They don't have the regular Blu-ray or the DVD, both $22.96 and $17.96. They also have a two-film collection set of the 2021 Candyman and the 1992 one for $19.96. Now, hmm, let's talk about Candyman, shall we? Now... I am a big fan of the Candyman franchise, particularly the first Candyman movie. The early 90s, man, when that came out, that terrorized people. It became a huge hit based off of a story by Clive Barker and a very interesting villain played by Mr. Tony Todd. It was terrifying, intriguing, alluring, scary... Oh, he was everything that kept you up at night. And they did a really successful job at that first Candyman movie. It was great. Now, the sequels, to varying degrees, they've had success. Second movie, I happen to tend to like the second movie. It's not perfect, nowhere near as good as the first film. But I still think it's a solid sequel for what it is. The third film, Candyman Day of the Dead... Okay, it's not all that great, folks. I'll be real with you. I tend to kind of have a s little bit of a charm to the movie to a certain extent. Not perfect, but way better than a lot of other, like, straight-to-DVD trash that was coming out at that time or has come out since. Not great, but, hey, I've seen a hell of a lot worse, folks. <laughs> so, I'll take it, man. And then it really didn't do well after that, right? I mean... The third film came out, didn't do as well as the second film, second film didn't do as well as the first film, and the franchise just kind of died, it stopped, until many, many years later when Jordan Peele has come to the rescue to save the Candyman franchise. So was it worth it, right? Was all of the work that put into this resurrecting Candyman yet again, was it worth the actual resurrection itself? I mean, I was kind of nervous about the movie, to be real. Why are we going back to the well here? But I was willing to go with it because I like Jordan Peele as an artist. I like what he's done with horror flicks. Yes, he didn't direct this movie, but he was very heavily involved in it. And I liked the direction where I thought they were taking the movie. So I was like, okay, I'm going to give this a chance, right? So I saw it in the movie theater with John. John was intrigued as well as I was. And we're off and running. Basically, it's about this starving artist who hears about the Candyman legend, Cabrini Green, all that jazz. He ends up going in search of the Candyman legend, finding out more about it, the history of it. And the more that he dives into it, the more that he ends up spreading the Candyman terror in people's minds. And suddenly... Candyman is resurrected yet again. I won't really go into, like, huge details on the movie, per se, but 
It's an interesting dive into the Candyman legend. It's a reboot, a reimagining, and yet a sequel at the same time. It's a lot of things all at once, and I don't know if it all entirely worked. I mean, the acting here is really well done, so I give everybody a lot of credit in the acting department. They're taking this seriously. It's not a wink-wink, nudge-nudge situation. It's not played for comedic elements. It's all serious. The drama is serious. The horror is serious. I really appreciate that, especially coming from a Candyman m movie. You don't want to play this thing for laughs, and they don't do it. So I do appreciate that very, very much. However, I gotta say, outside of that, man, the movie didn't really scare me. It's not a scary movie. And I think a lot of the opportunities to really terrify the audience, I thought, were missed. I thought a lot of the blood and gore that they could have done... I thought it was abstract, it was in the background, or it was sort of in the corner when you're looking into a mirror and it's not really there. You hear the slices with the hook, but you don't really feel the impact, you don't really get to see the horror, you get to see some of the aftermath of it, but not even all that much. So as far as like a, a new school horror blood gore fan, it doesn't really deliver in that way. As I said, it doesn't really deliver in the scare department either. And even the characters, the problem with the characters is they're either pretentious douchebags or they're so stupid and idiotic at moments where you just sit there and say, oh, come on, man, seriously? Do you really have to be that much of a goddamn idiot? Really, you have to fall for that shit? Like, there's so many times when I was just rolling my eyes and... I couldn't believe the fact that these characters who seem to be smarter than your average teenage idiots turn into complete and and other schmucks and dumbasses at the drop of a hat. I just really thought that was lame and completely unneeded and I thought that Jordan Peele was better than this. I thought that some of these people who were making this had seen the genre before, had seen the pitfalls of the genre, and didn't want to quite go there, but yet they did at the same time, but not with that kind of charm or cheeky quality that you get from a Friday the 13th mo movie. They didn't quite do that, and I understand why it's Candyman, but if you're going to make the same mistakes that a lot of other slashers have done time and time again, at least do it with a certain amount of flair, and they didn't even really do that. And even the mythology itself gets really convulted, confused, and rushed. Especially the ending. The ending is incredibly rushed, man. Because at a certain point, they're like, okay, we gotta finish this shit. We gotta wrap this thing up. And so they start explaining stuff out of nowhere and start connecting the dons. And then this whole mythology of other Candymans over over the decades and the centuries and how they pass on the legacy and I'm like wait a minute that was never in any of the other Candyman movies so it just really came out of nowhere as part of a new thing within the mythology that honestly kind of really pissed me off man it really did and I got extremely upset by that shit dude I'm like this could have been a hell of a lot more clever it could have been a hell of a lot more interesting and I don't think they really did it as well as I was hoping for. And even the new Candyman, because I'll just be real here, we don't get Tony Todd here as the Candyman. Like, you're thinking, okay, Tony Todd has been Candyman for three films. He is Candyman. He personifies Candyman, just like Robert Englund personifies Freddy Krueger, and Doug Bradley personifies Pinhead, so on and so forth. And we have the technology now within movie makings to de-age people. So why couldn't we have kept Tony Todd as the Candyman? Why couldn't we have done it? And there's no explanation for it. We just get this new Candyman that honestly comes across more as a petter ass than he does actually scary. And I'm just being real with you. I'm being honest, man. I mean... It just doesn't work, and I understand that they're trying to take the Candyman from the 90s and updating it to modern times. I understand it, I get it, but I just don't think it quite worked. And I think that's the problem with it, man, is that trying to take 
old school horror and turn it new school is not an easy task to do and I think this is one of many that have failed. I really do and it's just a goddamn shame about it man. I mean I wasn't scared by it. I was more frustrated by anything about the rushed mythology, the limptic scares, and the real stupid idiotic moments that I just kept shaking my head at and saying, man, we can do better in horror movies. I know we can because I've seen it done way better in a lot of movies in the past decade. But this one, unfortunately, falls down a lot of bad rabbit holes that it could have avoided, and it just doesn't. I know I'm probably in the minority, and a lot of you guys really love this movie. But for me, as far as horror films are concerned, especially when I've watched as much horror films as I have over the years, I'm expecting better. And especially from Candyman, he raised the bar, and this... It's a major letdown. It unfortunately is, guys. Sad, but very much true. And when you put it in a two-movie collection, you're really comparing it to the original. You really want to do that? Because this one is way, way more superior than this film will ever, ever be. Just saying, guys. Just saying, man. I mean, unfortunately, that's all the movie love you get. I mean, only Candyman. Other than that, I mean... They have the tags for Jungle Cruise, they have the tags for Prisoners of Ghostland, Eyes of Tammy Faye, but nothing at all. zippity doo -da. A little bit of new release love, but that's about it. Then again, this is the first Walmart. What are you really expecting? Let's head out. I just thought about something, guys. If I were to say Walmart five times, like Candyman, maybe the, all the physical media would show up? Think I should try? I don't want to tempt fate. <laughs> no, 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 no. Because something really bad could happen. If I say Walmart five times in a row, do I really want to go there? Oh, with Walmart? I think I'll pass. Just a little bit, I think I'll pass. I'll just wait till next week when all the physical media love that was supposed to be here this week will be here next week. Yes. The same old thing over and over and over again. Last week was the change of pace, but I think we're back in the original reality that we've been in for many, many weeks before. Last week was just a little different. This week, we're much more back to the same Walmart that I know and am always frustrated with. Ah, uh, yes. The good old days. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> sure, why not, man? Hey, at least we got one new release love this week, and compared to some of the other weeks that we've had to deal with Walmart, one is way better than zippity doo -da, than none. I think you guys would definitely agree with me, that is for sure. <sighs> and all the other stuff, we'll just have to wait till next week. <sighs> of course. <sighs> well, hey, at least we saw something. And let's be real, I didn't think we were going to see jack shit. I mean, I was hoping... But I wasn't betting on it. And I know you guys weren't either. But there is more new release love out there. I know there is. So let's go searching. All right, everybody. We are at our second location, Target. But before I go in, I got to talk to you guys about something. Now, if you didn't realize, within the next few years, we are very close to ending the Fast and Furious franchise, baby. Yeah. Whew. That's about damn time, don't you think? <laughs> it really is, man. God, I'm getting sick of family. <laughs> so, interestingly enough, we've had the recent film, Fast 9, uh, whatever, and obviously they're getting ready to do 10 and 11. Okay, cool, 10 and 11, and then sayonara, baby. Thank the fucking Lord, man. Now, a lot of the cast has come back in one way or another. I don't care whether they're fucking rising from the grave. They're coming back in droves, man, for these final movies. But you know someone who isn't coming back? And that is Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Yeah, Dwayne The Rock Johnson decided, <laughs> me coming back to this franchise? Shit, man, I got franchises on my own. Why the f*** do I need this? Well, apparently Vin Diesel wants to mend bridges now. I saw this article from Screen Rant, and I gotta talk about it. 
Fast and Furious 10, Vin Diesel asked Dwayne Johnson to return for a sequel. Oh, really? You getting on your hands and knees, Vin? I hope so, because you're going to need it. Vin Diesel has publicly asked Dwayne Johnson to return for Fast and Furious 10, currently slated for release on April 7th of 2023. Trust me, it'll be here before you know it, folks. Fast and Furious 10 will be helmed by longtime franchise director Justin Lin and will set the stage for the 11th and final film in the franchise. Many of the major franchise players are set to return, but notably Dwayne Johnson will be absent. Now, of course, he did say earlier that he wasn't coming back to 10 and 11, that basically... You know, he wished the crew and everybody good luck, but there's been a lot of bad blood between him and Vin Diesel. Really, there has. I mean, look this shit up, man. It's real. Crazy enough, man. And so, Vin Diesel ended up putting out a little thing on his Instagram page. My little brother, Dwayne. The time has come. The world awaits the finale of Fast 10. As you know, my children refer to you as Uncle Dwayne in my house. There is not a holiday that goes by that they and you don't send well wishes, but the time has come. Legacy awaits. I told you years ago that I was going to fulfill my promise to Pablo. I swore that we would reach and manifest the best fast in the finale that is 10. I say this out of love, but you must show up. Do not leave the franchise idle. You have a very important role to play. Hobbs can't be played by no other. I hope that you ride to the occasion and fulfill your destiny. Destiny? What? <laughs> what are you fucking kidding me? This is Destiny now? Oh, man, boy. Boy, you reaching, Vin. Damn, you reaching, brother. Holy shit. Th there's no confirmation that he's coming back or not. Maybe he read that Instagram story and he all got all caught up in the feels and he ended up being like, oh, Ben, and they had like a bro hug or something. I don't know, man. I mean, look, here's the thing about it, right? The Fast and Furious franchise ended up being revived on the backs, at least one of them, of Dwayne The Rock Johnson. I mean, you look at Fast Five and that changed the game. And I think a lot of people would recognize that. And that Dwayne Johnson was one of those people who basically brought it back to prominence. And there was always this sort of machoism back and forth between The Rock and Vin Diesel. And honestly, it just got really absurd at certain points. And you're like, guys, we're all making money here. We're all the big dogs. Why do we have to have this big, like, bro fight? What's what's really the fucking point? Everyone's getting paid. Everyone's making a shitload of money. And obviously, if it's, if it's successful, we're making more money. So what's the point of really fighting? But, you know, people with big egos got to fight over stupid shit. It's happened time and time again, man. And it's honestly going to continue to happen. This ain't nothing new. And it ain't nothing that's going to change anytime soon. But honestly, I put the blame here mostly on Vin Diesel, right? Because Vin Diesel has been here since the very beginning. The very first Fast and the Furious, he's been here. And so, if you are one of the main players here, if you are the one that's been here since the very beginning, and you're supposed to be the big dog of the franchise, you don't treat people coming into this franchise like dirt. You don't you know, start flexing your mu muscles in front of them and start talking shit about them and anybody on the cast that talks shit about them, you shut that shit down immediately. And I'm talking about Tyrese. And Tyrese has talked all kinds of smack about The Rock and if I was Vin Diesel, I would have sat Tyrese down and I would have basically, you know, shoved my ego up his ass and ended up saying, look bro, cut that shit down. He is a successful star. He's a bankable star. He's really done well for us in the franchise. Man, don't fuck this up. And I would be on his ass 110%. You need to. As a big star, as somebody who is part of the franchise, you need to do that. And he just hasn't. And now to want to do forgiveness now and have him in the series, he knows he needs The Rock. As much as he doesn't want to admit it, he knows that he needs him because... Fast 5 was successful, Fast 6 was successful, Fast 7, Fast 8. Who was in those movies? Oh yeah, it was Dwayne The Rock Johnson. And Dwayne The Rock Johnson brought it every single time 
He's a big star. He has a ton of followers and people who will go see the movie. He is somebody who has a big following and makes a lot of money. And so you need him on your team. And to get all pissy on him and do the whole, like, I'm... I'm the power, I'm the man act, and then suddenly wanted to ask for forgiveness? What kind of bullshit is that, man? I mean, look, maybe this will work. Maybe Dwayne Johnson will see the light and come back. But if I'm Dwayne Johnson, I would be like, why? What's, what's the point, man? I mean, this series has gotten absolutely ridiculous. It's not like it's going to get better anytime soon. It's going to get more crazy and out there. Characters are suddenly coming back from the fucking dead. We're going into outer space. So... Why? I mean, just so I can save your ass? I mean, seriously? I, I don't know, man. I mean, I want everybody to be in harmony and kumbaya and peace and all that jazz. I, I want it. But I also recognize that sometimes you got to walk away from a franchise before the franchise ends up taking you with it. And I think Dwayne The Rock Johnson knows that. Unfortunately, Vin Diesel doesn't, and as I've said, I think this series is now very long in the tooth. It should have already ended, and I understand bringing the team back together again. I understand the idea of everybody coming back together and ending this thing on a really great high note. Will it happen? I don't know at the end of the day if it will or not, but I'm... I'm always the hopeful optimist to want to see a franchise end the right way. But in order to do that, do you really need to bring The Rock back? I mean, it would be cool to see him do a cameo or something heroic. But I don't know. It, too little, too late? Maybe? I don't know, man. I mean, sometimes you you got to save face. And sometimes you got to be the bigger man and say that you were wrong. I don't know if Dwayne wants to accept Vin Diesel's quote-unquote apology, pseudo-apology, whatever it is. But you know what, man? If I was The Rock, I'd think really hard about this, man. Do you want to go back into this franchise for the last couple of ones and say goodbye the proper way to that character? Or do you want to just say, look, man, I had my fun. I did my spinoff. We might do a sequel, and I'm out. What do you guys think? Should he accept the apology and come back on the train? Or is he just happy for them being stuck in space and he got no part of it? Definitely let me know what you guys think about this. I just love that, man. I just love that. Vin Diesel is kind of ever so slightly swallowing his pride. And you got to at least appreciate that. For all that bro machoism bullshit, whatever that is, man. <sighs> I never got it and I never will. Let me know what you guys think about that. In the meantime, there is some new release love this week. Walmart had just a teeny tiny bit of it. But hopefully Target will have more. Well, geez, let's hope. How about we go in and find out? All right, everybody. We are in at Target. And yes, new release love. And the stocks are definitely sh pretty much fully stocked. But I'm not seeing a lot of new releases. I'm seeing one major one, and that is Disney's Jungle Cruise. The 4K Blu-ray Digital for $29.99. The Blu-ray DVD Digital for $24.99. The DVD for $19.99. And, ah, uh, yes, we can't forget a little only at Target exclusive love. The 4K Blu-ray Digital for $34.99. With an original exclusive design, art edition, and two limited edition foil etched prints. Nice, look at that. Pretty sweet. Very different from this artwork here. Very different from that too. I'm kind of liking this artwork, but I'm also liking the fact that the 4K is different than the Blu-ray and the DVD. I always love that. Different artwork for different releases. I always dig it, man. Not bad. Definitely digging that one. Pretty cool indeed. A little Disney ride turned into a movie love. Yes, we've seen that one before, haven't we? And we're going to see it again. Ah, yes. I got a chance to watch this on Disney+. Plus. I actually just recently watched it because it just recently came to the platform for free. I'm not paying $30 for that shit. <laughs> 
So I was definitely going to wait till it was free, and uh, I finally did get a chance to check this thing out, man. Now, I have never went on the Jungle Cruise ride. Never have, man. And I've been to Disney a couple times in my life. In my younger years, I went. Jungle Cruise was not a part of that. I have went on a lot of rides, but Jungle Cruise, unfortunately... Yeah, I never experienced that one, but it is very popular, and with Pirates of the Caribbean getting that love a long time back, it's time for more, and might as well Jungle Cruise step up to the plate. And basically, it's about this explorer played by Emily Blunt, who's obsessed with this rare flower and the properties that it possesses and basically she's not the only one going after it there is another person this prince who has evil deeds that he's going to do with it and he's basically in a race with her in order to basically find it first and she ends up employing Dwayne Johnson who is the captain of this rickety boat and they go on this crazy wild action filled Disney filled adventure oh boy can you can you feel the excitement and all the laughs and the fun and the thrills oh i know you can look i'm gonna be real with you first off the actors do what they do right i mean Dwayne the rock johnson can be very exciting very thrilling knows how to do the action really well emily blunt's a great actress there's a lot of people who are really good in this movie. Jesse Plemons, who plays one of the bad guys, is is pure evil. And he's eating up the screen with all his evilness. <laughs> okay, cool. And there's a few other people that have spotlight. Paul Giamatti has a small role in it. They all do well for what they have. Okay, fine. The movie is brightly lit. It's colorful with great music, exciting set pieces, colorful characters. Okay, you get it, right? The problem is is that this movie is been there done that. And that's the problem with it, right? Because this movie apes off of a lot of other films. I mean, literally sometimes stealing stuff from other films. If you've seen Indiana Jones, if you've seen National Treasure, if you've seen Pirates of the Caribbean, then you've seen this movie. Hell, they steal so much shit from The Mummy. Seriously, look at The Mummy and then look at Jungle Cruise and there is a hell of a lot of similarities between the two. Hell, they practically stole whole characters and sequences from, from that movie. It's crazy how much they stole from The Mummy. A movie from like 1999 or some shit, how much they stole from that. That's fucking crazy, dude. Look that shit up. It is true, man. And... Unfortunately, the chemistry between some of the actors is kind of lacking. I mean, there's kind of this romance undertone with Emily Blunt and The Rock that kind of falls flat. I mean, as much as I love Emily Blunt, as, as much at times that I enjoy Dwayne The Rock Johnson, I didn't think they really connected as characters. And I felt some of the acting was good, but... It felt like the actors were just going through the motions. I didn't really feel that they were characters. I just felt that they were caricatures of better characters in other movies. Like Marion Ravenwood from the Indiana Jones series. Indiana Jones himself. Brendan Fraser from the Mummy series. It just felt like certain properties taken from other films and plopped into this one. And that's a real shame, man. I mean, even movies like Romancing the Stone have a hell of a lot more excitement and chemistry than Jungle Cruise does. And that's really ultimately the problem because they're not really making a movie. They're making a marketing campaign for their products. And that's the issue that I have with this. I mean, this movie was somewhat successful, so we might get a sequel and the sequel may be better, but it just felt like we're making a movie based off of a ride and that's what it felt like. It didn't feel like they made a movie because there was an intention to make a good story out of this and tell intriguing characters and a great tale of of mystery and adventure. They have a ride. They see a marketplace. 
and they're taking advantage of it. That's what it is at the end of the day, man. Can I blame them? No, but the movie doesn't come across the best way. Like I said, if you've never seen any of those other adventure movies that I just mentioned, then you're going to be like, this movie's really exciting and it's fun. And I think kids are going to really love this movie. I think kids are really going to dig it. They're going to dig the the kitschy humor. They're going to dig the exciting set pieces, the, the colorful moments. They're going to dig it all. And that's cool. That's fine. But for somebody like myself who's seen so many other type of adventure movies, old serial you know, TV shows and cartoons... Jungle Cruise doesn't bring anything new to the table. It's just recycling the same thing over and over again in just a more plastic type of way. And it didn't really come across as anything genuine. Just another marketing piece for Disney, and that's it. It's a shame because it seems like the actors are really trying here. It's not like they're phoning in the performances or anything. But they don't really pull it off either, and that's the unfortunate part about it. Shame, but it is the truth, man. Like I said, there is exciting moments, there's things that I really dug in the movie, but honestly, I just kept watching the movie, and I was just like, oh, I've seen that before. I've seen that before. Yeah, that's been done better in other movies. And yeah, that's it. Shame, but... Tis the truth, folks. Again, when you base stuff off of a ride, sometimes it ends up being really good results, like Pirates of the Caribbean. Like Pirates of the Caribbean, based off of a ride, you thought that is going to be such a mundane movie and not really all that exciting and just a marketing ploy. And yes, it kind of is, but it ended up turning out way better than everybody expected it to be, even myself. I was amazed by it. And unfortunately, uh, lightning doesn't strike twice, folks. <laughs> And Jungle Cruise tends to prove that. Disney's great at moments, but then there's moments where they're just making a product for making a product. And this is an example of it. Shame, but it is very true, man. Cool that they have all of the Disney Jungle Cruise love. If you're into adventure films, it is good, but it has been there, done that, just saying. But then again, there really is no other new release love over here. I mean, they have more of respect, at least they finally got more of that in, and more of that Target exclusive love, but nothing new, new. This really can't be it, can it? Well, I guess we're gonna go searching. Well, well, they do have some more new release love. It's just hidden. It's not all in the front. It's also on the side with Wonder, yes, the only at Target exclusive steelbook for 1999. Ah, wonder, man. Nice. Very interesting, this getting the Steelbook love. I actually kind of dig the Steelbook, though. It's cool. The character wears that sort of space helmet in the movie to sort of hide his face at times. It's very much sort of like a lighter version of the mask, I would say, <laughs> with Cher. But it's such a really great movie, and... I really love it, dude. It's very heartfelt, heartwarming. The acting is fantastic here. Jacob Tremblay, amazing in the title role. Love Julia Roberts here, Owen Wilson. It it really tugs at the heartstrings, man. What a fantastic movie. Love this thing. I already own the movie, actually, because I really do dig it, and I love it so much. I don't know if I would really want the only at Target steelbook for Wonder. It's not something that I want to go out of my way to buy. I mean, the price is not bad. Only $19.99 for the Blu-ray digital steely, but I don't know. I mean, it looks cool, but do I really want to double dip on Wonder? As much as I really love this movie and think it's really great, it's great for both kids and adults, great life lessons in there, amazing acting. I think the story is fantastic. I think it's a movie everybody should should watch. I really do. But again, is it a movie that you really need to double dip on? I mean, if you don't own it, I would say, hey, go ahead and pick this up, man, because the Steelbook looks really cool. And I mean, it is wonder. It's a fantastic family drama type of movie one that doesn't get made enough, and one that deserves a lot of love. But as far as the double dip, that's a different story. If it were to go down maybe five or so bucks, I might get it. See, there's so many things I want to pick up right now, guys, that 
Wonder is kind of on the back burner, but if it goes down a little bit more in price, it might be worth a double dip. But for the meantime, I don't think this is going to sell out anytime soon. I could be wrong. Steelies go for big money nowadays on the eBay market. But would a Wonder Steelbook actually do that? I'm not so sure, guys. But I've seen stranger things in physical media, so why not this? Cool Steely, great movie. Not sure on the double dip. Now, wouldn't you know it? <laughs> Fast and Furious love. Oh, yes. The Blu-ray digital of the Fast and Furious 9 movie collection for $70. Damn. Think about this, right? So, the Blu-ray digital of the A movie collection is $50. That is $70. Bucks. So, for $20 less, you're literally saving yourself a very cringy experience from ever watching part nine that's a steal <laughs> shit oh my god man i mean and interestingly because this is the dvd of the nine movie collection and this is the blu-ray right but i actually like the cover on the dvd way better than i do the actual like blu-ray cover i mean all it is is basically vin diesel with black smoke behind him in his car that that's it like, wow, what a dynamic cover this is. Boy, that, that's really going to get me to get all hot and heavy and pay $70 for this shit. Yeah, no fucking way, dude. Like I said, man, I have a lot of love for Fast and Furious franchise. I truly do, man. But honestly, my love ends at part 7. Anything after that, yeah, not much for me, man. I'm curious to see how the shit ends, but honestly, anything after 7 is just fodder as far as i'm concerned man huh interesting to see it here but family yeah this ain't condiment <laughs> yes the 4k blu-ray digital for 29.99 the blu-ray dvd digital for 24.99 and a dvd for 19.99 it's so weird because the new release love is spread all over the place here at target man like now we're over in sort of like the back side area all the most of the new release love is usually up there but now it's over on the side here sure why the hell not a little bit here a little bit there wherever as long as we got it here i'm a very happy physical media boy and see more candy man well i don't know how i really feel about that <laughs> But, shit, I'll take it. Uh, you know, I did talk a little bit earlier about the whole sort of new mythology that they have in the movie. The idea of a new Candyman every generation and how the Candyman legacy gets handed down to a new Candyman over time to keep the legacy continuing and going and how there's like this ritual and a prophecy and it got really confusing and really convulted and there was no need for it why it was never brought up in the other three movies there was never any like oh there's there's more candy mans and the legacy has to continue and we need to make more candy man so that that the legacy will live on and people will still be scared of the candy man like, like come on man you know, there is something to be said for keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> like, there literally is, man. Because think about it, right? Freddy Krueger, he ended up getting, you know, burned. He was messing with children, and he died in the fire, and he came back to exact revenge. Okay, perfect. You look at Michael Myers, and Michael Myers is this killer who ended up breaking out of an insane asylum and ended up going after you know hor horny teenagers okay cool jason drowned in a lake coming back for revenge against the camp counselors that did him and his mother wrong okay cool jeepers creepers comes alive every 23 years, eats for every 23 days. Okay, cool, right? Keep it simple, stupid, all right? There's something about it that you definitely have to appreciate. And yes, every now and again, it gets really convulted, and that's when I sort of 
check out i guess i mean think about with the whole michael myers like uh, the rune stones and and the druids and everything like that and suddenly i'm I'm like in my oh my god are we really doing this shit (laughs) like that happens or something in like freddy's dead where there's these weird flying demonic entities that went into freddy and they're controlling him and he has to feed them souls and it's like like what the fuck whatever happened to the simple days where he was just like this this dream entity what the fuck (laughs) like at a certain point in a franchise and it really is true at a certain point they have to over explain think about that because it really is true man it's the same thing with jason Voorhees. like jason goes to hell suddenly he's body hopping and he has to go into another Voorhees to be reborn and his his heart and his heart is alluring to people and they eat his heart and then his soul is in them and like they start to melt their bodies when they're when his soul is in them for too long like what the fuck? like no 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 like it just it just goes all over the place man and at a certain point you're like get back to basics man and I just feel like we never needed to go here with Candyman. We never needed to enter into that shit. And now that we are, there's no need for it. And I just don't quite understand it. And I'm still trying to figure that out to this day, man. I I really am. I'm not entirely sure, man. I mean, every franchise eventually gets here. But it's usually like franchises that have many many sequels over a short period of time and they eventually have to over explain make it more intriguing to keep the audience there but again people were there for a reason and not for the convulted rune stones druid shit (laughs) they never really were man but i don't think i've ever really seen a a sequel-ish reboot many 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 years later decades even trying this shit that is really weird man kind of bold but really weird and i don't know how i really feel about it i'm not sure that i even like it to be fair tony todd is the candy man and that's it there's no other explanation and i think they needed to try to do that to sort of backdoor more candy man movies in the future but by doing that, I think just they created a whole fucking mess, dude. I, I really do. I just kind of wonder what you think. I mean, every horror franchise eventually gets here. And, well, welcome, Candyman. It's been a long time, but you're finally among your brethren. <laughs> you finally are, man. Definitely let me know what you think about that, man. Uh, all weird Candyman mythology, horror mythology, body hopping, rune stones. And now new candy man every single generation. Well, we were bound to get here. Now and we're finally here. Praise Jesus with the Blu-ray Digital of the Eyes of Tama Fray for nineteen ninety-nine the DVD for fourteen ninety-nine. Ah yes. A little televangelist love. <laughs> Apparently so, man. So, I got a chance to watch this on Amazon Prime, right? And here's the thing about it. I really had no interest in watching this damn thing. I really didn't. I'm not a religious guy, not at all. I mean, somewhat for the Jewish religion, because I really do love that shit. (laughs) I really do. Yes, not everything. I'm sorry, gefilte fish is terrible, so fuck that, man. (laughs) But... There's a lot of Jewish traditions that I do dig into, but I'm not like an ultra-religious guy. I've never really been. Neither is my mother or my girlfriend. It's just not something we dive into all the frickin' time. And I knew of Tammy Faye. I knew of this woman. I knew of Jim Baker because of the commercials and how prevalent they were on TV at the time when I was younger, when I was a kid. So I knew of them. And I knew of their influence, but I never really knew their story. And because I was Jewish, that whole like, Christian thing never really affected me exactly. But it affected a lot of other people out there. And so here I am thinking to myself, I'm like, okay, this is a biopic about Tammy and Jim Baker. And they're these religious televangelists. And so I'm like, why would I have any interest in this shit? 
So I really went into this film, guys. Seriously, I went into this film with with like the lowest of expectations, and I was like, I'm I'm probably gonna be bored as shit watching this. It's over two hours long, man. This thing is gonna bore me to tears, man. And you want to know what happened? You want to know the surprising thing that ended up occurring? Crazy enough, praise Jesus, apparently. <laughs> But this movie is damn good. And I'm serious. It is really, really good, man. I am surprised as shit. Like, I was never bored for a single second for the two plus hours of this movie. I was loving it. I was intrigued. I was entertained. The movie was amazing. And I was thinking to myself, if I ever, ever thought that I would spend two plus hours learning about a biopic about a fake televangelist and be entertained by it. Man, I thought that shit never happens, but apparently with this one, it does, man. Damn. Look, I'm going to be real, man. The story is just really fascinating of Tammy and Jim and how they met and how they really felt like they needed to send out the message of God and the religion and spread that love, but they didn't really want to do the conventional ways that everybody else was doing it. They wanted to do something different. They wanted to do something more unique and more friendly to the viewing public. And they went ahead and built an empire out of it, an empire that literally... 20 million people a day watch their PTL net network. Amazing stuff, man. How they went from such little means to end up being this huge religious powerhouse. It's, it's fascinating stuff, man. And, and the movie is really, really intriguing. And I got to admit, I loved every second of this. Not only did I love that, but the acting is phenomenal here. Andrew Garfield playing Jim Baker fantastic jessica chastain playing tammy faye let me tell you something man if jessica chastain does not get an oscar nomination for this movie then the oscars the academy awards are bullshit okay they are absolute bullshit she deserves a huge nomination for this if not a win because she is amazing in this movie and sometimes unrecognizable like the makeup that they put on her was so subtle but yet so Tammy Faye that the actress just gets lost within the makeup and the costumes and becomes the actual woman herself. Amazing. Fantastic acting from everybody across the board. All the minor player to the major players. Everybody brings it here, man. The story was never boring for a single second because... They're taking the religious aspects, right? But they're not doing it in a mundane way. Because sometimes religion in certain films can be a little bit preachy, can be a little bit overdone, overboiled perhaps. And with this movie, they do it in a way that is very accessible and fun and kitschy. And before you know it, you fall in love with Tammy Faye and Jim Baker and you're like, wait a minute, these, these, these people are fooling me just as much as they're fooling the actual audience that they were dealing with at the time. And it was it's so interesting to me, man. It, it truly is. I really dug this movie, man. The history of how they got screwed over so many times creating the 700 Club and then getting screwed over by Pat Robertson and then their whole network that they have just to see it all tumble down because of scandals and rumors and how and how Falwell screwed them over as well and how they were puppets and pawns just how they played other people as puppets and pawns so amazing so fantastic if you have not heard of this movie and honestly, I can't quite blame you because I didn't really hear much about the movie. Technically, this movie was made by 20th Century Fox. Well, who owns 20th Century Fox now? Disney owns 20th Century Fox. So they really had no interest in this movie and they really don't care much about it. So they kind of only put it out in select theaters and it was kind of hush-hush and quiet. But 
the more people who have watched it, the more people have really dug this movie and the acting and the performances and the story. And it's done really, really well, man. This is a movie that's kind of being put under the radar a bit. But I'm telling you guys, I know to say about the religion stuff and like, come on, who wants to see a biopic of Tammy Faye Baker? Seriously, I was the same way. Seriously, the same exact way. I was saying to myself, I really don't want to see this shit. <laughs> I really don't. Who cares about this? But after watching it, I'm like, I was so incredibly entertained that I would easily watch this again. It's crazy to say that. I would watch The Eyes of Tammy Faye Baker over Candyman any day of the damn week. And that's so weird to say, but it really is the truth, man. It's such a wild, crazy story. And the fact that it's true is even more incredible. I mean, I've always said that biopics, they're kind of a little bit of a mishmash, right? Because sometimes there's a lot of truth in there and sometimes there's a lot of fiction as well. And you kind of got to ride a line with, with it. And sometimes it works out better than others. This time around, it worked out crazy, insanely good, man. Way better than it has any right to be. And this is definitely worth a two-hour journey into <laughs> into religious nut jobs that took a lot of people's money and did a lot of crazy things. <sighs> and to think they kind of got away with some of it. Man, religion can be one wild fucking ride. Oh, and let's not forget little Spidey love with Spider-Man and his amazing friends. <laughs> Okay, preteen Spidey, huh? Yeah, you know I know about this. I've never seen any of the episodes, but I know because my girlfriend and I were going through the Disney Plus catalog, and this came up, and I'm like, "Huh? Okay, we're doing a little Spidey for the kiddies, you know, because we don't want kids doing the ad more adult themed stuff that goes on with Spider Man in his teen years, you know, like." girls and death and destruction and girls <laughs> yeah we don't want to do that we'll just have little preteen spideys walking around all over the place great wonderful not only do they stop to you know take out a bully or two they need their juice boxes and they need their diapers changed very important <laughs> Very important indeed, man. Spidey teams with his pals to become the Spidey team. No kidding, huh? No shit. Every web singer is about to discover that he can fight supervillains and rescue anyone even better with his superhero friends by his side. Together they, get this, they stop Doc Ock and Octobat from invading the web quarters. Ooh, ooh dangerous. And that, they take care of a cute puppy while stopping Rhino's rampage. It's very important to, to save the puppy. If anything happens to that pu puppy, God forbid, damn it. <laughs> that, and rescue Trace E from the Trickster Green Goblin. Oh, man. Boy, they got a long day ahead of them, man. <sighs> Sippy cups, diaper changes, and saving a puppy. Man. All in a day's work, apparently. <laughs> apparently all in a long, long day's work. Good luck, Spidey. You're going to need it. Oh, indeed you will. Hmm. I'll take the Rugrats crew. I definitely will, man. They got that. I also forgot to mention that they do have that two-movie collection Candyman set for $21.99. They have that. They do have a little DC Legends of Tomorrow Love, the complete sixth season, for $19.99. But, oh, that's not all, ladies and gentlemen, because they do have... And get ready for this shit... Oh, yes, what a day, what a lovely day. The 4K digital of the Mad Max anthology for $80. Whoa, wow, man. Finally seeing the anthology love for Mad Max, man. This actually was supposed to come out a long while back, and I think he kept getting delayed over and over and over again. And finally, it's in our glorious hands. Oh, man. Mad Max, The Road Warrior, Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome, and Mad Max Fury Road. Oh, man. 
all that Mad Max love, 4K style. I'm definitely digging that, man. That is cool. That is really, really awesome, man. Damn. Finally getting to see that, dude. I got to admit, I am kind of a Mad Max fan. I mean, some of the movies I like better than others. Like, the first Mad Max is good. I tend to like it. It's not as good as The Road Warrior. The Road Warrior is probably one of the best ones. It really is. Much more action-packed, crazy wild characters, ridiculous set pieces. It's it's great, man. It really is. Mad Max is a good setup, but Road Warrior is a really great payoff, man. Oh, beyond Thunderdome, though. I mean, it has its moments. I mean, Tina Turner as the bad guy, that is pretty cool shit. Ain't gonna lie, man. And the song, I love this song. Actually, the best thing about the movie is the song. What the hell am I talking about, man? We don't need another hero. <laughs> I love that shit. Uh, Tina's good, man. Uh, Tina, Tina's great, man. Love, love, love the shit out of that movie itself. Uh, not as good as the other two. Ain't gonna lie, man. But Mad Max Fury Road, though, man, that is the shit. That is amazing, man. I remember seeing that in the movie theater with John and we were blown away by the movie dude we were like well we entered into the movie we're like okay Mad Max is cool we like some of the movies but I mean what more can they do with Mad Max right and this movie was like dude hold my beer <laughs> like, seriously George Miller blew the roof off of the doors of, of action movies he reinvented the shit man and it's glorious, amazing, madcap, insane, crazy, wild, ridiculous, whatever you want to say, it is fucking balls out amazing. It truly, truly is, man. I love the shit out of that. I really do, man. I mean, Tom Hardy's great. Charlize Theron is kick-ass. The set pieces are awesome. Uh, Morton Joe is one hell of a bad guy. The the look, the design, the the chase scenes, everything is so amazing here, man. The fact that he pulled a lot of this off practically, like barely if any CGI at all, fucking phenomenal, man. Love that shit out of that. Probably the best Mad Max movie of all time, man. I mean, I know they're thinking of doing like a prequel or something. Fine, cool, whatever, but dude fury road is where it's at dude and i love the whole like guitarist on the back of that of that vehicle and it's like shooting out fire and shit and he's like <laughs> like, I'm, like, I'm like what the fuck it's like so crazy and weird man i love that shit dude damn man oh dude i i would love to see another mad max movie with mel gibson coming back and playing a very old grizzled mad max dude i would love that shit i don't think we're ever gonna get it but i'd love to see it but the fact that george miller continues to do crazy wild action stuff to this day is amazing man and i love that shit i really do fucking phenomenal dude mad max Man, that shit is where it's at. That is for damn sure, man. And 4K love, that's one of the reasons why I at least appreciate the 4K format because it gives a new spotlight on older films that deserve it, right? Because there's been so many releases, but putting it in a new format gives it a certain amount of new appreciation that I really do dig. And hopefully the Mad Max love will definitely get that, man, because it definitely deserves it in a big, bad way, man. The fact that this franchise started in 1979 and the fact that it's still going strong to this day, that says a lot, man. Not every franchise can say that, but Mad Max definitely can, dude. Definitely. Oh, it is indeed lovely to see all that Mad Max 4K goodness here. Finally getting able to see it. That is pretty damn sweet, man. I mean, they have that. They also end up having over here, they have, they have Friday the 13th 8 movie collection that, that I was eyeing. Yes, with that red case. Ah, oh, so cool, man, for practically like 60 bucks, man. I own like three different Friday the 13th sets. <laughs> dude i own so much of that shit already man but this is pretty sweet dude not gonna lie man pretty damn cool hmm 
for all you Friday the 13th fans out there. If you're only f looking for the eight films, cool little red case in there and not bad artwork. That is pretty sweet too, man. I mean, they have that and a hell of a lot of good movie love this week. I mean, mind you, it's kind of all over the place. There's some new stuff here. There's some new stuff there. There's some new stuff sprinkled in over here. And then over here, all that Christmas goodness. Oh, yes. Still all that sweet, slippy love. Exclusive Target Steely love. And everything in between. Not half bad this week. Not half bad for Target after all. Let's head out. Walmart on the downside. Target on the upside. Oh, yes. I am in the right universe after all. <laughs> Indeed, I am, dude. Target killed it this week. They did a great job, man. They are definitely stocking all of that new release love. They're bringing in the box sets. All of that wonderful goodness for upcoming Black Friday and the deals that are going to happen. Yeah, it's spread out all over the place, but... You gotta appreciate all that physical media goodness, especially when Target definitely does their due diligence on it. And they've been doing it quite well as of late. They indeed have, man. Not always perfect. Last week definitely proves that, but for the most part, they are making me a very happy physical media boy. That is for damn sure, guys. Not banned this week. Target exclusive love, Target steelbooks, and some great new releases and surprises along the way. Definitely digging it this week. Hope you guys are. But there happens to be more new release love out there, so let's keep it rolling. All right, everybody, we are at our third location, the second Walmart. I'm going to go in and check out if there's any interesting indie titles worth showing off. If there is, I'll bring it back to Film Fan 108 HQ and show it off to each and every one of you. But before I do that, I got to talk about a trailer with you guys. And this is coming to Netflix very soon. And I'm very much anticipating this one. And that is Cowboy Bebop. Oh, yes! Anticipation for all you anime lovers out there. However, I got to admit, I have never watched a single episode of Cowboy Bebop as far as anime is concerned. Never, no way, not a... I've told you guys before, I'm not really into anime, and a lot of stuff has passed me by. Yes, I know, maybe I should get up on Cowboy Bebop. Maybe you guys gotta let me know whether it's worth it. It is very popular, though, from what I know, and they are now finally doing a live action version, and the trailer dropped not too long ago, and I wanted to check it out, man. And this looks awesome! It looks great! It really does, man. I mean, basically, they're like bounty hunters in space and they're basically finding these criminals for a good price and basically trying not to get killed in the process and all the wacky crazy adventures from there man it looks amazing the designs of the ships and the universe and the design of the, the characters and the costumes and it's so vivid and wild and imaginary it is so awesome and it looks almost like almost like a space adventure that like the oceans 11 crew would go on or some shit like it, it looks great man it looks really fun really adventurous and i can't wait i mean i love john cho I think John Cho is such a great actor, man. I've loved him in so many projects. I mean, a lot of people found him through, like, Harold and Kumar and a couple other things. No, no, I'm even further back than that, guys. I remember him from the MILF days. Oh, yes, the American Pie MILF days. MILF. <laughs> like, I remember that shit, man. I go that far back with John Cho, man. So... I've, I've loved John Joe for a long time. Such a great guy, great accomplished actor. I really can't wait to see how he dives into this. It looks like he's having fun, man. Hell, everybody looks like they're having a ball here. And it really shows on screen. The designs look so cool. It looks like they definitely put the budget, the time, and the energy into this. And this is something that they definitely needed to do. Now, there is always a reservation when it comes to translating something from anime to live action, right? Because it hasn't always worked. A lot of people end up saying Death Note is one of those ones that is like, ooh. <laughs> like, no, no, it didn't work. I never watched Death Note, the live action one. Um, 
I do probably have to watch it at some point, but I've heard really bad things about it, man. I truly have. I mean, a lot of other people have mentioned a few other things that have had live screen adaptations out there. You know, Ghost in the Shell, for one, which didn't quite work out the way we really wanted it to. And a few other ones here and there. I've heard a lot of negativity. I, I truly have, man. And I understand why. There's been a lot of disappointment and a lot of people, you know, put up the guards, man. They put up their guards and their red flags and they just don't quite want to believe that something's going to be good. But there's always hope out there that, yes... Even though we've had a lot of bad adaptations, there'll always be one that comes around which will be sort of that glimmer of hope, right? It's happened with comic book adaptations for for decades. It's happened with video game adaptations and so on and so forth. And now we're here with anime stuff. So be patient. You'll get the love sooner or later. We just got to go through a lot of bad shit in order to get there. But Cowboy Bebop might actually be the one that actually breaks the trend. It looks amazing to me. I am dying to check this out, man. You guys got to let me know. Are you excited for this? How do you think it'll compare to the anime? And is the anime worth it? You guys got to let me know. It looks cool, man. So I'm definitely on board in a big, bad way. I hope you guys are too. Definitely let me know. In the meantime, it's been quite interesting this week for physical media. How about we go into the second Walmart and hopefully more good things to come. All right, everybody, we are in at the uh, second Walmart, and I gotta tell you, the new release Love This Week is pretty good, man. A little bit surprised on that, especially so close to Black Friday, I figured we wouldn't really get a lot of love, but, oh, we're proven otherwise this week, man. So when it comes to the indie weirdness, does the train keep rolling for physical media? You're damn right it does. Oh, yes indeed, baby. It always roll on with the second Walmart love. The weird, the odd, the ridiculous, the bizarre. Oh, they're supplying it in a big, bad way, man. Not a ton, but a decent amount. But decent, especially with this place, can go a long way. Oh, it can. Can't wait to show it off. So we are heading back to Film Fan 108 HG, where you have the SEU. Showing off all that ridiculous goodness. You ready, buddy? <sighs> Don't scare me like that, damn it. Hmm. Didn't know I had that effect on you. Well, your face definitely does. Okay, that, that stare could definitely melt somebody's heart, okay? Okay, I get it. I apologize. I guess. Just show off the physical media. Yeah. You better apologize. Unless you want the hook to come after your ass. I do have a point. <laughs> I do indeed. I don't know. Ooh, that's by hook. I've seen it done in film. In real life, that could be some gruesome shit. Ah! Ah! Damn. That does hurt. Oh, shit. Ah! Ugh. Wait till I get the real thing. Oh, wait till I indeed do it, guys. Oh, man. Just you wait, damn it. I could be the next Candyman! Could you see me with the hook? I bet you could. Uh, until that happens, guys, how about some physical media love? That can be some scary shit, but this week, hey, it actually turned out to be pretty damn good so far. Some really great releases, a lot of stuff to show off, and when it comes to the indie Walmart love, it rarely ever disappoints. And this week... Some weird oddities, ridiculous B-movie cheese, and that, that can be some truly scary shit. Oh, 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 all that Walmart weirdness is back again, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, yes. Time to dive into the ridiculous, and I can't wait. Let's check out what we have in store this time around, with the first title being 
the resort oh i'm liking that cover look at that man that is so cool then again it also reminds me of another poster from like a year or two back fantasy island Ooh, god i hope it's not anything like fantasy island man that shit sucks <laughs> shit man but i do like it man that the the island is like a big old giant skull there's something about that that's really cool and kind of catches your eye too it looks it looks intriguing put it that way the movie itself might be another thing oh what is this four friends head to hawaii to investigate reports of a haunting at an abandoned resort in hopes of finding the infamous half-faced girl when they arrive, they soon learn you have to be careful what you wish for. Let me guess. They find the half-faced girl <laughs> and pay the ultimate price. Oh, man, oh, man. Ghost stories, ghost stories. There is some really good shit when it comes to ghost stories. There truly, truly is, man. Some of that shit is absolutely terrifying at times. It definitely is, man. Like, for instance, and I gotta always mention when it comes to ghost stories, and that is The Fog, man. The Fog is amazing. I love this movie, and I love the idea of these legends, and the idea of the anniversary coming up, and these ghosts that are within the fog. There's something about that that's instantly creepy and terrifying and atmospheric, so amazing, so wonderful, man, no wonder this is a classic, John Carpenter, baby, gotta love it every single time, of course, you also gotta have some love for Ghost Story, which is absolutely amazing, and is really, really creepy, man, it's, it's really great, I love the characters in that, great atmosphere, love that movie, of course, you gotta say, go ship love, <laughs> <laughs> of course, you got to do Ghost Ship, man. So good. And that opening sequence, my God, man, so goddamn awesome. I mean, the rest of the movie doesn't quite compare to the opening of the film, but it's still a solid little flick that I do like, man. Lest we forget a little 13 Ghosts action, anybody? Oh, yeah, I cannot forget about this one. You know, when I first watched 13 Ghosts, I wasn't a huge fan of the movie, but then it kind of grew on me year after year the more I watched it, man. I truly love the design of all of the ghosts. I think it's pretty darn cool with the house and the different incantations and the the revolving doors and, and the ghosts going in and out and trying to attack you. I think it's pretty cool. I actually really dig this one a lot, man. Very, a very great film, man gotten better over the years the more i've watched it actually kind of dig that one quite a lot man that's not bad of course i also really gotta mention crimson peak oh crimson peak is so goddamn cool man i love crimson peak man very gothic and Guillermo del Toro does an amazing job with the atmosphere and the foreboding sense of dread so amazing here. The the ghosts are absolutely terrifying and haunting. Love this movie so much, man. Great, great film, man. I kind of one of the underrated Guillermo del Toro ones, but so damn good, man. Love that one. So there is some really good ghost tales out there of people trying to go after ghosts, but failing big time. And unless you're a Ghostbuster you ain't getting out of this one alive. <laughs> I'm just saying, you're going to need at least a couple of proton packs and maybe a prayer or two. <laughs> you definitely will. It looks like it could be kind of fun, goofy, ridiculous, maybe a couple of interesting kills outside of that. Been there, done that. Cool cover. Might not be the best movie, but then again, with this type of film... What did you really expect? Don't worry, what's under the bed? Worry, what's underground? And it came from below. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> oh great. Cool, look at this. Nice. Miles below the earth. It has awakened. Oh, I'm liking that. Look at that. Oh, that's cool, man. That is pretty damn sweet. 
It has been waiting. Oh, it has it now. <laughs> oh, look at that. Some weird, like, looking chupacabra motherfucker. <laughs> Whoa. Dude, that looks cool, man. I wonder what this is about. Jessie and her friends go deep underground to find out what happened to her father, who once claimed a monster lurked within the caves and killed his friends. Wanting to uncover the truth, they soon become hunted by a deadly creature from another world. Oh, you goddamn stupid kid. <laughs> Seriously. Oh, you know, your, your father gave you a fucking warning and you didn't fucking listen to it and now you and your friends are gonna fucking die. Oh, man. And not gonna lie, probably deservedly so. <laughs> oh, man. Monsters! God damn it, do I love monsters. I'm a huge monster fan. I think my love for monsters came from the Universal Monsters, the old school ones, right? Because I was a huge fan of it back in the day because my mother was a huge fan. She was a huge fan of those old school black and white movies. She became a huge fan as a kid and she passed that love on to me and I sort of took it and ran with it. I mean, my love for horror really stems from her love for it and monsters are cool and they come in so many different forms, man. You gotta love monsters. For instance, Chud. You know, cannibalistic humanoid underground dwellers? Yeah, hey, right? <laughs> <laughs> I love this movie, man. Cheesy, ridiculous, but I fucking love it, man. So fun this movie is. I, dude, it's just a ball. Weird, but I love the underground weird monsters, man, with like the glowing eyes. It's just so fucking cool, man. I wouldn't want to become one of them, but, you know, maybe I'd be friends with them. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, they have that, which is always really cool. Of course, you can't forget about a little deep sea horror. Yes, deep sea monster horror with deep rising. Damn, do I love this movie, man. God, I just love this cruise ship and these almost Cthulhu-like monsters that are that are ripping the ship apart and killing people. I just love that shit, man. So good. And Tree Williams is badass in this movie, man. Fucking dig it. Love the hell out of that one. That is really cool. Of course, I gotta mention a little Rawhead Rex. Oh, man, do I dig this movie as well. Ah, the design of the monster is so freaking cool, dude. So great. Oh, man, this is a great cult classic movie, man. Deserves a hell of a lot more love than it gets. So great, Rawhead Rex. Love that. Of course, sometimes it's a little bit of crazy, ridiculous B-movie monster horror, like The Suckling. Oh my god, man. When I first saw this thing, I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> Seriously, man. Like, this woman who gets her fetus aborted and... It ends up, like, dropping into some, like, toxic waste and ends up turning into this weird fucking monster-style humanoid creature. So fucking bizarre, man. But the design of the creature is so great, dude. It's ridiculous. It's definitely B-movie cheese, but I enjoy the fuck out of that movie. So, so good, man. Enjoy that. Of course, like I said, monsters come in many different forms, shapes, sizes. Hell... Not gonna lie, guys, it even comes in the form of killer boobs. <laughs> oh, it really does, man. Oh, it comes in all shapes and sizes and different forms, even on different body parts. God, do I love monsters. And I have a hell of a lot more of them in the collection than just those, man. My God, do I love them and dig them, man. This kind of looks cool, I'm not going to lie. Yes, it could be ridiculous and cheesy and cheap and terrible. It could, let's be real, we're talking about indie horror here. And sometimes indie horror can really surprise us. And at other times, it can really underwhelm us. I don't know where this one is going, man. But I do actually like the design of the creature, man. It looks cool. It looks almost something out of, like, the 
X-Files or Tales from the Dark Side or something you see on Tales from the Crypt or some shit. I mean, all the stuff that I love. It does look cool, man. And I always say, if you have a really good-looking monster, then, yeah, maybe the movie's not so great, but the monster itself could lift up the movie from being mediocre to being something a little bit better than that. This has the potential to be it. Of course, we do have stupid people going to look for a monster and finding out that it's actually real and then it's way too late and then they're trapped and then it gets them one by fucking one. <sighs> of course, they never learn. If they did, we wouldn't have horror movies, folks. But look, good news is the monster is getting fed. And, you know, as long as the monster gets some good eating, well, doesn't matter if they're stupid, smart, women, men, doesn't matter. We need to feed the creatures out there because, you know, they deserve the love. We can sacrifice a few stupid pe people from time to time. As long as the monsters live, I say it's a fair trade. Enjoy your stay. At the last inn. Yes. <laughs> Once you check in, you'll never check out. <laughs> yeah, no shit. <laughs> oh, oh my god. Because of stay, you'll never forget. Oh man, oh man, you yeah, don't say, huh? Jeez, if that doesn't say creepy, I don't know what the fuck does. <laughs> Holy shit. Ah, very interesting. I like the cover, man. I am digging it. Hmm, the upside down cross too. Man, what the, what else does this place have? <laughs> Shit, the last in. Hmm. When university student Laura loses her memory, damn, what a bummer. She's only left with a thought to visit the island of Galveston. On her journey, everything gets in her way. She encounters car accidents, mudslides. And collapsed mountain roads, finding yourself completely cut off from the outside world. Wait a minute. If if you are encountering all of this shit, maybe, I don't know, maybe it's a sign to not go to this motherfucking place. <laughs> I mean, seriously, if everything is literally happening to literally make you either not go there or be trapped, just saying, get the fuck out. <laughs> Seriously, man? Damn. The only place available is a peculiar last inn, where Laura decides to seek shelter. Little does she know that by entering the creepy old house, she will trap herself in a life-altering game. Evil spirits are released by a terrifying cursed doll, and horrific events are triggered by an ancient Asian pencil fairy ritual. What the fuck? One thing is clear, once you check in the last in, you'll never check out. Jesus, man, they have creepy hotels, cursed dolls, ancient rituals. I mean, what's next? A, a possessed refrigerator? What the fuck? Jesus, man. God damn, dude. What the fuck doesn't this place have? Jesus Christ. <laughs> Good Lord, man. God, if the mudslides and the, you know, car accidents and all the things that they're trying to to trap you in doesn't exactly give off red flags, shit, everything else might as well. Damn. <laughs> Fuck, man. Yeah, I don't care how good the going rate is at the hotel. Yeah, my ass is sleeping in the car. <laughs> That's all I know, man. Jesus Christ. It is creepy, but is it as creepy as another hotel, which is just as infamous? Oh, yes. I think you guys know where I'm going. Oh, I think you guys do with The Shining. Oh, man, do I love The Shining. God damn it. So, so good, man. This hotel... Once it grabs you, it never lets go. Oh, indeed it won't, man. So iconic, so wonderful. Jack Nicholson going absolutely bat shit crazy. And Shelley Duvall trying to survive. Man, against that axe, good luck. So good, man. And I just love the creepy imagery and just the haunting nature of the hotel. Man, Stanley Kubrick, he did it great. 
I gotta admit, man, fucking classic for a reason. Love it, love it, lo- love it, man. Gotta dig that one. And I also gotta say, probably identity as well, man. I mean, yeah, not as creepy as The Shining by no means, but it is a creepy motel, and I love the characters and the deceptions and the double cross and the mystery to it. I do dig this one quite a bit, man. Very, very well done. So there is some creepy ones out there. Of course, there's always more to explore as well. But this place, oh my god, this fucking hotel. (laughs) Jesus Christ, man. Good, everything and the kitchen sink involved. Man, what a what a bargain. <laughs> what a bargain indeed, dude. My God, man. Jesus, this thing literally... God, this woman is, is fucked. She is so impossibly fucked, man. From the word go, she is never getting away from this fucking place to save her life, man. Once it has a hold of you, yeah, it's, it's never letting go. <laughs> Yo, man, she's so screwed. Oh, Lord. Creepy kids, creepy dolls. Oh, my God. Yeah, try getting a good night's rest in this motherfucker. (laughs) Jesus, Lord, man. Give them credit, man. When they go all out with a hotel, they definitely do it. And this one, man, it's got everything. If you're looking for a creepy, horrific experience... Well, you can either visit the Hotel from The Shining or this place. Honestly, you probably have a better bet of surviving at The Shining Hotel. (laughs) Ain't gonna lie, man. This place, I think it's set up for you to get killed from the word go. But if you're down for that, well, I think you might give it a five-star rating. Good luck, though. Babysitting can be a real bitch apparently so in the shut original uh, caveat you've been warned <laughs> oh, uh, you have oh baby what is this yet another shut original huh hmm in desperate need of money aren't they all isaac accepts a job looking after the landlord's niece olga for a few days Okay, sounds simple enough. What's the catch? Ah, uh, but there is a catch. Indeed, there is. He must wear a leather harness and chain that restricts his movements to certain rooms in order to protect Olga's extremely frail mental state. Seriously? Once left alone with Isaac, Olga exhibits erratic behavior while Isaac makes horrific discoveries in the house that trigger a deeply buried traumatic memory. Whoa. Whoa, what the fuck is she doing with that weird stuffed animal bunny? What the fuck? The hell? (laughs) Jesus, man. I mean, look, I ain't gonna lie, man. I'm hard up for money at times. I truly am. I'm not babysitting the landlord's daughter and strapping myself into a leather harness and restricting myself fuck that i mean shit i'll I'll work at mcdonald's before i do that shit (laughs) fuck man damn god are you kidding me jesus man and this guy's just asking for it damn dude fuck man go fuck up i fucking work at taco bell or some shit you really need that cash that badly (laughs) Fuck, apparently so, man. Damn, dude. I mean, creepy circumstances in creepy houses, it's not like it's anything new. It's been done a time or two over and over again, hasn't it? Yeah, it has. However, one of my favorite ones that I've loved over the years, one that I really, really dig, and it's actually a really highly underrated one, or at least I think it is, guys, and that is none other than... The House of the Devil. Oh, man, do I really dig this movie, dude. I think this is so fucking phenomenal. It is a slow burn of a horror movie. Okay, I will give it that. Basically, this girl who, yes, needs money, don't they all, 
and ends up taking this babysitting gig and is just goes way in over her head, man. And all the creepy stuff and the haunting imagery and circumstances that are happening around her. And she's trying to figure out what's going on. Is it all in her head? Is it real? I really love this movie, man. I really dig this film. As I said, it's a slow burn. It's not a fast, quick-paced horror film by any means, but I think the payoff is very well worth it. The performances are fantastic, and I just love the great atmosphere in this film. So fucking phenomenal, man. Really, really well well done, dude. Way better than I think people really give, give a credit for it. Really, man. And there's a lot more out there as well. But obviously, Shudder likes to take interesting concepts and twist them into something new, or at least tries to do it. Sometimes Shudder is very successful at doing it, and other times, they're kind of lame. Not gonna lie, man. Interesting idea that has been done a time or two, but with a little bit of a spin on it. Interesting, I suppose. I mean, look, I'm not gonna lie... This person is kind of asking for it, at least with the other movie, you know, everything seems alright, everything seems fine, she's just doing a simple babysitting job, and things start to creepily happen over the course of the night. This, you're already strapped into a fucking leather harness, and your movements are restricted, that alone would give me some bad juju, <laughs> okay? That really honestly would. Seriously. There's better ways to make money, motherfucker. There's better ways, man. Give blood. Give, give your fucking sperm. I, I don't care. Just don't do this. The creepy thing that you could easily fucking avoid, man. God damn it, man. You're just asking for it. You really, truly are, man. And at this point, you fucking deserve it, you fool. <laughs> You really do. Oh, man. It's probably got some cool, maybe creepy imagery to it or s certain aspects that are unsettling. It all depends on the idea, the premise, how they execute it. Sometimes it can turn out really pleasant to surprise and other times it can end up uh, being kind of underwhelming. Where does this rank it could rank somewhere kind of in between possibly it's got some creepy imagery creepy stuffed animal bunnies sure whatever <laughs> it's got some interesting stuff to it that could work maybe it is shutter 50 50 chance good bad you take a gamble with it good luck <laughs> good luck indeed Really, find a better fucking job, bro. <laughs> really, man. Oh, interesting indeed, as is all of the Walmart weirdness this week. Oh, all kinds of horror staring me right in the face. Huh. And I do love some horror goodness, especially when it's that ridiculous B-movie cheese that only Walmart can provide. Trying to find ghosts especially infamous evil ones on a remote island. Yeah, that makes all kinds of sense. Sure. Oh, and you want to know what, guys? If I saw this creeping in my toilet, well, first of all, I'd wonder if I ate Taco Bell that day. And if I didn't, boy, I'd be getting on a health kick real goddamn quick. <laughs> oh, indeed I would. Let's be real, guys. If I ever travel, and if there's any inns, hotels, motels like this one, uh, you know what? Sleeping in my car sounds like a real goddamn good idea. <laughs> oh, indeed it is. And you want to know what? Look, man, I am hard up on money at times, ain't gonna lie. But this... Yeah, no. I'll flip burgers... I will clean up toxic waste. Hell, even working for Jeff Bezos doesn't sound half bad. <laughs> oh, it doesn't, guys. Oh, what interesting Walmart weirdness this time around. Very, very interesting indeed, man. Oh, yeah. <laughs>
that was quite intriguing indeed, man. As is physical media every goddamn week, guys. I say it every single time, but it really bears repeating, man. The indie oddities, the unknown gems, the Hollywood blockbusters, physical media tends to have it all, man. The artwork, the special features, the exclusive love. Oh, yes, every single week is always worth exploring. You guys know that, but I always got a champion physical media. That's how I am. I'm a lover of physical media, after all. A lover of movies. And any time that I get to explore some interesting and unique movies out there, it's always worth it. It indeed is. And this week has been no exception. Some really great stuff so far, guys. But, oh, we are not done yet because we have one more location to go to. And the surprises aren't done yet. All right, everybody, this physical media train hasn't stopped rolling yet. And let's hope it continues. When we head to the last location, and that is none other than Best Buy the Beast. Best Buy, baby. It has been quite an interesting physical media week, that is for sure. A lot of great things that we have checked out. Very interesting discussions, as always. And one more to go. What will Best Buy have in store? Hopefully all that new release love, steelbook love perhaps, and everything in between. And chaos, because let's be real, we're getting towards Black Friday and uh, the insanity keeps on going. Let's hope we make it through. In the meantime, let's see all that physical media love. All right, everybody, we are in at Best Buy under the new releases and already... I'm seeing the new release love shining, and that is none other than the Blu-ray DVD digital of Candyman for $22.99, the 4K Blu-ray digital for $27.99, yes, say my name, bitch, <laughs> oh man, you want to know what, why can't we create new horror villains? Why can't we create new horror icons? Why do we have to come up with the same shit over and over and over again, man? I mean, look, there's a certain amount of appreciating the old school stuff. And I definitely do. Okay, I want to be real. I really do love the old school stuff. But isn't it time to create new long-lasting icons that will take the mantle over for the ones that have stuck around for a long time? Aren't they just a little bit tired and need to go to the retirement home and rest just for a little bit, man, to rejuvenate? I mean, seriously, man. I mean, think about it like this, right? Back in the day, we had Dracula. Frankenstein, Wolfman, Creature from the Black Lagoon, Invisible Man, you name it. Horror icons, right? And long-lasting, lasted decades, generations, still going strong to this day in different iterations. Truly appreciate it, right? And then in the late 70s or 80s, we ended up creating new icons that would take up the mantle, so to speak, and create new nightmares for new fans that have lasted for a long, long time, right? Michael, Jason, Freddy, Pinhead, Chucky, Leatherface, and many, many others, right? And then in the 90s, we created even more and even past the, the 90s, I mean, Chucky, Leprechaun, Jeepers Creepers, Candyman. Now, we created a lot of them, and they've stayed eternal, and they've kept on going year after year after year. Icons of the genre, heavyweights, so to speak, and rightfully so. Obviously, Ghostface and a few others as well. But, unfortunately, over the years... We've sort of lost it in some ways of creating horror icons. I mean, some in recent years we definitely have created. Like, for instance, Art the Clown. Oh, yeah, Art the Clown is some good shit, man. It really is, man. That is some iconic horror villain stuff and some good horror villain stuff as well, man. That is amazing, dude. I mean, yes, to a certain extent, I guess... Pennywise has been freshened up, but that's old school. You can even say that's old school, man. New school to a certain degree, but yeah, I'd say old, old school, man. And unfortunately, there's just not as many horror icons, new generation horror icons, as there used to be. Some people would say, well, you know, what about the Babadook? It's okay. 
I mean, is it really horror icon status? I kind of doubt it, man. Perhaps Jigsaw is a horror icon, one of the new age horror icons. And yes, I would agree with that. He is. However, is he one of those horror icons that we're going to go to decades and generations from now? I'm not entirely positive on that. I mean, then again, there is one that is really fantastic and only one movie behind the belt, but so iconic. And that is none other than good old Sam. Yes, trick or treat Sam. Now that is a horror icon that I can truly get behind, man. And there's been a lot of horror icons that have tried to be updated towards modern times. Some failing, some not so failing. It depends, honestly, man. But there's not many horror icons anymore, especially new ones, right? I mean, I just named Sam, which we can all agree is a horror icon. I can name Art the Clown, which will, in time, be a horror icon if it isn't already a new age one to begin with. But... A lot of them, unfortunately, try to get repackaged in a new way to update it to modern times. And sometimes that works better than others. Like, for instance, there's Texas Chainsaw Massacre, that remake. I happen to really like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre remake. I actually think it's pretty good. Not perfect. Not as good as the original, but I still really dig it, man. I still really think it's pretty goddamn cool, man. I mean, the Friday the 13th remake. It has its moments, put it that way. I don't hate the damn thing, but it has its moments, man. Then again, let's be real, dude. The Nightmare on Elm Street one is a piece of shit. <laughs> it's really fucking bad, man. Like, that is the pinnacle of shittiness. It really is. I mean, repackaging that to a modern audience is like that? Jesus, man. It's like smearing shit in fans' faces, man. Damn, I saw it in the movie theater, and I was... I was so offended, man. I almost asked for my fucking money back, dude. I, I was so fucking pissed, man. And then you have, like, the the Child's Play remake that was shit as well. And, and now this. And sometimes we should just let the classics lie, right? We should just let them go and let them be. And they are what they are. And there's just nothing else we can do with them, right? I love the old school Friday the 13th movies, the Nightmare on Elm Street ones, the Halloween movies. I like those old school ones. I don't need Rob Zombie to come in and tell me that Michael Myers has a shit past of a life and really crappy redneck type parents that basically turned him into the evil that he is. I don't need that shit, okay? I don't need it, man. I really don't, okay? And so... I look at this movie and I can see the honest intentions in it. I really can. I can see why they did what they did and trying to bring it to a modern sensibility and update it for modern times and bring an old school horror icon into the new age. But it doesn't really work a lot of times, man. Unfortunately, majority of the time it actually fails and fails hard. So, I just want us to create new horror icons out there. I want to create new ones that can stand the test of time, like we did in the late 70s and 80s and some of the 90s, man. I just want that. Unfortunately, that's easier said than done, man. And I think, unfortunately, the remake train is just going to keep on going, and we're just going to keep getting movies like this that are rehashes instead of trying to make new icons out there that can really reinvigorate the horror franchise i don't know it's up to you guys you know what do you guys think do you like the old school stuff to stay the old school stuff or do you want these old school icons to be reinvigorated one more time sometimes it's just happy to let icons lie for a while and keep the old school movies as they are sometimes you don't need any more ones in a franchise you don't need any any more add-ons Sometimes the stuff you have is good enough as it is. Kind of curious what you guys think about that. I mean, they do have deleted and extended scenes, Filmmaker's Eye, the impact of black horror. I mean, I will say this. Candyman is definitely an icon of black horror. He is somebody who's been an icon of the the African-American horror experience. And I really appreciate that and appreciate the fact that he was an icon in that way. And 
in that way, I understand why we're updating it to modern times. We can do so many great things in horror with political statements and everything like that. There's a lot of great things that we can do in horror, and Candyman is definitely a part of that, but I would like for it to be something going forward where we create new icons that challenge our sensibilities rather than having to rehash the old stuff. Definitely let me know, guys. They do have one more steelbook love here, something new that came out this week, and that is Rand from Akira Kurosawa, 4K Blu-ray Digital for $19.99. I don't think I've ever really heard about this movie before. Great looking steelbook though. Thing looks kick ass, man. Nice. Akira Kurosawa. I do know who Akira Kurosawa is, and I know that this filmmaker has been an influence for many, many people, hell, including George Lucas. George Lucas ended up creating Star Wars, and one of the inspirations for Star Wars was Akira Kurosawa, man. Makes amazing martial arts, old school martial arts movies. And he's, he's one that a lot of filmmakers have aped off of. A lot of samurai films have definitely been influenced by this filmmaker. And I can see why, man. I do know some of the work, don't know all of the work. Huh. Here's all this visually dazzling samurai epic. Huh. That's really interesting, man. I'm not going to lie. Huh. I'm really fascinated by this, man, especially like an old school Kurosawa film being a Best Buy exclusive steelbook. That's really cool, man. That is really awesome, man. I really dig the hell out of that. I'm really fascinated by this. I'm not going to lie, man, like a Kurosawa film being a Best Buy exclusive steelbook. And you real rarely never see that shit, man. You really don't, dude. So this is one I can definitely see being a hot seller, man. I really can, dude. Huh. I do like a good old school samurai movie. Kurosawa is a classic director. This is one I think is going to be a hot ticket item over time, man. This is definitely one that's going to sell out big time, and glad I got to see it. The artwork is really cool, man. I definitely got to look in into this. This looks really intriguing to me, man. Hmm. You guys got to let me know how Ran is. That looks pretty damn sweet. And for $19.99, that's a pretty goddamn good deal. I ain't going to lie. That's pretty goddamn sweet. It really is, man. I mean, they do have more of that Mortal Kombat love, which is really cool. They don't have any more of the Justice League love. That shit sold out big time, man. So did Godzilla v. Kong. They still have a little bit of Injustice Steelies, too. They have that Best Buy exclusive 20th Anniversary Edition of Fast and Furious still. The Steelbook. I mean, they have a lot of cool stuff, man. Really cool indeed, dude. And new release love as well. Not bad. Some pretty cool stuff we're checking out so far. And let's hope it continues. And on the other side of the new releases, oh yes, we got some Mad Mac love, baby, yes. Oh, I'm digging this. We got the regular 4K Blu-ray Digital Edition of Mad Max Beyond the Thunderdome for $24.99. I actually really dig this artwork, man. I think it's really cool. I love Tina Turner in the background, her eyes staring into Mel Gibson's soul. <laughs> I love that shit. Man. I actually think the artwork is better than the movie is. <laughs> Seriously. Oh, man. Sometimes, like, the artwork tends to be better than the actual movie is. Remember back in the day, like, you know, going to, like, the, the video store and you'd see the artwork and it'd be so cool. And then you watch the movie and you're like, damn, the artwork is so much better than the fucking movie was. <laughs> This is one of those examples, dude. Pretty cool artwork. I like that, man. And the Steely Love as well for $31.99. Ah, that Best Buy exclusive goodness. Not a bad artwork either. I'm definitely digging that too. Ah, pretty sweet. I'm liking that. But that's not all, man, because they also have a little Mad Max The Road Warrior Love. That regular 4K Blu-ray Digital for $24.99. And that is a really good artwork as well. Very representative of the movie, man. Love that. Hey. I, I love that, dude. Oh, man, so cool. That shit's awesome, man. Great fucking movie, man. And also the Steelbook Love as well at Best Buy Steely uh, for $31.99. Very good artwork as well. Really digging that one. That looks pretty cool too, man. Not bad. I got to admit, though, I actually kind of appreciate the regular 4K art better than the Steelbook art. 
I mean, the steelwork art isn't bad, it's pretty decent, honestly, but I do kind of dig this artwork a little bit better. Something about it just intrigues me a little bit more. I don't know why. I mean, sometimes Best Buy really kills it with their steelbooks, and these aren't bad, don't get me wrong, but I think these are just a bit better. They only have the Road Warrior and Mad Max Thunderdome, though. They don't have the regular Mad Max, and they don't have Fury Road, but I'm assuming they got these in, so eventually they'll get the other ones in as well. Let's hope. I mean, more Mad Max love can't be bad, right? So I'm thinking about taking a cruise in the future, guys, and if my tour guide ever looks like Dwayne Johnson, I think I'm going to leave his ass off the boat. <laughs> I really do, man. Oh, we definitely do got some Jungle Cruise love, man. The Blu-ray DVD digital for $24.99, the 4K Blu-ray digital for $29.99, and that ever-reliable Best Buy exclusive Steelbook love for $34.99, man. Look at that. Actually, that's a pretty cool Steelbook, not gonna lie. I love the imagery on that. That's pretty sweet, dude. I mean, compared to the other ones, I mean, that I really do dig, but the Steelbook, that's looking pretty sweet, man. I'm liking that. And on the inside as well, that's cool. I'm not going to lie. That is pretty awesome, dude. Not bad. Pretty nice indeed, dude. Not bad at all. Huh. So I got to be real with you guys, honestly. I mean, as much as I love this Steelbook, and trust me, this Steelbook looks really cool. When Best Buy does a phenomenal Steelbook, they hit it out of the park. This one, hey, I'll give it credit. It really does. But is the movie worth it? Is Disney really worth it anymore? And look, I'm not talking about Marvel, okay? I'm not talking about them because I really still love Marvel. The Black Widows of the world and, you know, Shang-Chi, you name it. I still really love them. And even, like, some of the stuff that they've acquired from Fox. I mean, technically it's not Disney, but they've acquired this old it is still them to a certain extent i mean that stuff too but the stuff that disney is making just for disney's sake that's the thing that i'm not so sure about anymore guys i mean they're taking the animated stuff from way back in the day and now making live action villain origin stories but did anybody really ask for it they're making movies based off of rides. Then again, this isn't the first time they've done it. Like I said, they've done it with Pirates of the Caribbean before with phenomenal results. Okay, I'll give them credit for that. They're going to start to do a Tower of Terror movie with Scarlett Johansson. But then again, they already did a Tower of Terror movie. That was with good old Steve Gutenberg and Kirsten Dunst. <laughs> Ah, yes, that old-school movie way back in the day that nobody remembers except us few old-school Disney lovers, man. That was some good stuff, dude. But I don't know. It just kind of seems like they're spinning their wheels, right? They're just doing the same thing over and over again. Or if they are doing something new, they're sort of taking elements from other things and sort of polishing it up in a nice, new, neat turd. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if it just takes, it's all bad. I mean, the animation stuff that they do is phenomenal, man. I mean, Soul is amazing and all that great stuff that they've done in the past, like, like Coco and all, all the Pixar stuff, amazing, dude. So I can't say it's all bad, but at the end of the day, though, a lot of this live action stuff that they're doing, and it's the same with what they're doing with Star Wars as of late, it's just the recycling of a lot of old storylines repackaged into something new, and it's the same thing with Jungle Cruise, man. I mean, as much as I really appreciate the movie and appreciate the sort of adventure old school style aspects in a new way of filmmaking and polishing it up for a new audience, a younger audience, it felt like been there, done that, I've seen it before, and I've seen it done much better. I just wonder when enough is enough, right? I mean, unfortunately, I don't think that's ever going to happen because unfortunately, money talks, bullshit walks. These movies make money because young kids out there eat this stuff up like popcorn. It, they really do, man. And there's always going to be a hunger out there for it, so... At the end of the day, who can really blame somebody for making this stuff? If you can make the money off of it, if you could make more than what you actually paid for the product, why not actually do it? It makes a lot of sense. But as somebody who loves cinema, as somebody who is a movie lover, 
I'm just not really into the same old, same old. We really need to do new things and new territories. And that's what I loved about Disney back in the day. As somebody who, who used to love Disney, who used to love the brand as much as I did, I loved all of the newer stuff that they were doing, all of the sequels and the original animation stuff. It felt fresh and invigorating, and you always felt like you were you were as so excited for the next thing to come out from Disney. And I don't know if I'm quite there anymore, man. I don't know if I am. Like Jungle Cruise was all right, but it's not as thrilling as I wanted it to be. The characters are not as exciting. It's just the same thing, constantly repackaged. And at a certain point, that kind of gets a little bit mundane, and it kind of gets just a little boring. I'd like to see Disney change, but again, bullshit talks, guys, and the money talks. And unfortunately, the bullshit is basically saying, hey, as long as you're making money off it, continue to fucking do it. And that's what they're doing, man. I kind of wonder what you guys think of that. I mean, look, there's going to be a particular amount of people that are going to love Jungle Cruise, and I'm just not one of them. And I understand it. And there's certain things that I love that other people don't. But honestly, don't you want to see Disney do newer stuff? Stuff that really challenges the audience. Stuff that is not the same old thing you've seen time and time again. Unfortunately, in cinema, we've seen so much that it's hard to do something new, but it's not impossible. You can still do it. You just got to be creative about it. But Jungle Cruise, yeah, that's not one of them, guys. Shame. It seems like everybody was really passionate about the project. Dwayne Johnson really wanted to make it a really great movie, and it really felt like he was passionate and wanting to make it work. So was Emily Blunt and everybody else involved. But unfortunately, it didn't quite work the way that I was hoping. And at the end of the day, if the chemistry isn't there, if the movie is just the same old thing you've seen repackaged, it doesn't really excite me the way that I was hoping for. Then again, there's always next time, and when it comes to Disney, you know that's the case, guys. Indeed, you do. I mean, you got a lot of great special features here. You got deleted scenes, outtakes, making of Jungle Cruise, Dwayne and Emily undoubtedly funny. Sure, whatever. Right. I don't know, man. Like I said, it's okay, but it can be better, and Disney can be better, and... I just wish they would challenge themselves a little bit more. This, not much of a challenge, guys. And that's a damn shame. Well, some very interesting physical media over on the new release side. I mean, they still got a lot of Steelbook love for Three from Hell. More Hitman's Wife's Bodyguard. Hmm, still don't got that Free Guys Steelbook. Damn it. One of these damn days, man. They're gonna have it. Don't breathe the two love old. They still got actually a decent amount of old steelbook as well. I'm kind of surprised. I mean, the movie's not that great. I guess I'm not really all that surprised. But, you know, steelbook love, Best Buy, usually that shit sells out fast. Apparently not this time around, man. Hmm, I'm still waiting on that Black Widow steelbook, dude. Eventually, one of these damn days, man. One of these damn days, I'll have it back in and it will be mine. Until then, guess not so much. But they are setting up some more Black Friday goodness over here. And a little bit over there as well. Oh, yes. Trust me. I'm definitely seeing the Black Friday displays going up. And we're getting ready in a big, bad way. Can't wait. But in the meantime, there's new releases here. Let's see what else they got. And on the back side here, it's looking a little bare, I dare I say. Looking pretty rough, man. But there is still a little bit of media we're showing off. I guarantee it. With the Blu-ray digital of Never Back Down Revolt for fifteen ninety nine, yes, wonderful, cheapo action goodness, huh? I, I bet, man. Huh. When an amateur fighter is unwilling to throw a fight, his sister Anya must travel to Rome and fight for an elite audience to help pay back her brother's debt to crime boss Julian. When she arrives, she's taken by the merciless Jack and quickly realizes she is. Among many women who have been abducted and forced to fight for a deadly trafficking syndicate, oh, those bastards. Anya's only options are to surrender to Janak's demands, or band together with the other women and take down their captors. Oh, yeah, motherfucker. 
<laughs> sure, man. You want to know what it kind of reminds me of with like them in the arena fighting for their life? It kind of reminds me of like Best of the Best 2. Do you remember that shit, man? With like the evil dude running the Coliseum being Wayne Newton? <laughs> That was awesome. Oh, my God. Best of the Best 2 is fantastic, man. I love that shit. Oh, so cheesy, man. But I, I, I dig it so much, man. Eric Roberts is great. You know, fight, fighting against Wayne Newton's evil minions. There's something about that shit that I absolutely fucking love, man. I don't know about this. It's cool, the idea of, you know, these women and this trafficking syndicate and fighting each other and then banding together to beat the shit out of them. Yeah, cool. I get it. Never back down, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fight to survive. Yeah, no shit, man. I've seen a lot of fighting movies, survival fighting movies. I've seen a lot of them, dude. And this one probably apes off of a shitload of them. And I'm not going to lie. Doesn't that kind of look like a cheapo version of Channing Tatum? Just a little bit. Yeah, it kind of does, guys. It probably has its moments of being cool. But honestly, been there, done that. Ah, the 4K Blu-ray. Of Yakuza Princess. <laughs> oh, nice. Revenge is her destiny. Oh, indeed it is. <laughs> yes. Huh, interesting. Masuma, Jonathan Reese Myers, really? Interesting. I'm liking that badass babe on the cover with the sword ready to kill. Liking that, man. Huh. Yakuza Princess follows Akimi, an orphan who discovers she is the heiress to half the Yakuza crime syndicate. Seriously. Forging an uneasy alliance with an amnesiac stranger who believes an ancient sword binds their two fates. Akimi must unleash war against the other half of the syndicate who wants her dead. So it's kind of like an action thriller flight fantasy, maybe, kind of, sort of. I don't know, man. It looks kind of interesting to me. I'm not sure, dude. I don't know. Huh. Interesting. I do like a good, like, Yakuza sword epic type of movie, man. Like, like the stuff that Takashi Miike has been doing as of recent. Like, 13 Assassins or some shit. Like, that was really good. Like, I love that Tom Cruise one. The Last Samurai. That's awesome. And there's so many other really great ones out there, man, that have been really cool and awesome. This one looks kind of interesting. Yakuza crime syndicates battling for honor and revenge. I love that shit, dude. It could be bloody. It could be brutal. It could be action-packed. I love every minute of it, man. Hmm. Interesting. Could be up my alley. I do like a good little sword and, and battling and stabbing people and blood gushing all over the place. Yeah, I tend to like that shit from time to time. <laughs> Indeed, I do. And Yakuza Princess definitely, hmm, might be something worth it. Interesting imagery and uh, interesting color palette. Probably some cool set pieces. And Jonathan Reese Meyer somehow stumbling into a Yakuza crime syndicate movie. Sure, we need an American here. Why the fuck not? Jonathan Reese Meyer, we couldn't get anybody else. <laughs> Why the fuck not him? It could be kind of cool, man. Never seen it, but I am up for a good bloody good time, though. Oh, yeah, I almost forgot <laughs> the uh, weird-ass Nicolas Cage love this week with uh, Prisoners of the Ghost Land. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> with Nicolas Cage and Sofia Butella. God damn, man. This, this movie is fucking nuts. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Oh, Lord. Hold the F on. Yeah, I'd, I'd definitely say that. That's for damn sure. Oh, my God, man. Jeez, this movie. So, I got a chance to watch this on Amazon Prime, man. And I don't really know what the fuck I was expecting. So, Nicolas Cage plays this criminal that robs a bank, right? With his partner. And it all goes wrong and terrible. And gets caught by, by the police. And gets brought to the governor of this town and it just so happens to be played by Bill Mosley of all people man like Chop Top from Texas Chainsaw Massacre too for some odd fucking reason but uh, okay sure and his daughter's gone missing he wants her to be found and employs Nicolas Cage in order to do it but he doesn't quite trust Nicolas Cage so he straps this suit on him that basically there's like 
explosives attached to the suit. Like, there's two up by his neck, there's one on each arm, and there's, like, two that are right by his testicles. Like, one one explosive for each ball sack. <laughs> and so he's off and running to basically find this guy's daughter and he only has a certain amount of time to do it before the explosives basically blow up and basically he's kaput so you know i mean if your balls are in jeopardy you really have no time to spare <laughs> i mean seriously man god damn dude this movie i mean it sounds simple enough right but this is a Nicolas cage movie man nothing's really that fucking simple man I mean, basically, it's it's this sort of Chinese town which has been devastated by war or radiation, nuclear stuff, whatever it is. And so it's almost like kind of like a Mad Max world meets a weird Nicolas Cage flick. Like, what the fuck? And even that sounds cool. But it's not nearly as cool as what you have in your own mind, man. Because it's just so weird and odd. But it's not, like, weird and odd cool like Mandy is. Like, Mandy's just balls out insane. This is, like, kind of balls out insane. But it's just weird. Like, it makes no fucking sense. Like, Japanese people breaking into song, weird Mad Max outfits... It's almost like if Mad Max Fury Road was made for, like, $5 and a Happy Meal. <laughs> like, I'm like, seriously, what the fuck, man? And you get occasionally, now like, Nicolas Cage doing his, like, crazy Nicolas Cage, like, hey, hey, doing his crazy, weird Nicolas Cage stuff. But then again, sometimes you get kind of mundane, neutral Nicolas Cage, kind of neutered down, and you're kind of like, Ooh, I don't know if I like this, man. <laughs> like, I like dramatic Nicolas Cage. Like, you either get, like, Pig, you get Mandy, or you get something really mundane like Prisoners of the Ghostland, which is kind of odd to me, man, because there's so much odd weirdness in here that you would think it would be entertaining, and at points it kind of is, but you're just sitting there kind of scratching your head like, none of it makes any sense, and it's just weird for weird sake. I mean, I understand why Nicolas Cage is here, because, I mean, that guy's one weird fuck anyway. But, I mean, seriously, man, it's just odd. It really is. Where, like, weird people who are affected by nuclear toxic waste end up battling Nicolas Cage. And they're, like, melting like the fucking Toxic Avenger. <laughs> and they're battling him with swords and there's a yakuza crime syndicate who is helping the governor and the governor is corrupt and he's using these women as his playthings and these women are used as wax dolls almost and weird imagery weird set pieces weird characters none of it makes a lick of fucking sense and it's just odd for odd sake it's not exciting it's just kind of blah it's just kind of there it's kind of like if somebody puked up a little bit of mad max a little bit of mandy a little bit of the toxic avenger you know a little bit of like you know 13 assassins and kind of just mixed it all together and just fed you it for like mystery meat friday or, <laughs> or some shit and again like, that sounds kind of cool, but I guarantee you, man, it is not. It's just kind of weird and mundane. I mean, again, it, there's cool moments when sort of some of the explosives go off and, like, Nicholas Cage is, like, screaming for help, and he's like, oh, my God, one of my balls just, <laughs> just ended up exploding. And it's just kind of w w cool to see him sort of go crazy and insane, but then again, like, I can watch Mandy for that shit. I can watch Color Out of Space. I can watch Vampire's Kiss. I can watch Face Off. I, I mean, I got a whole bunch of shit I can watch from Nicolas Cage, man, that make a hell of a lot more sense and is a hell of a lot more exciting than this shit is. I'm, I'm just saying, man. I mean, I, I mean, I know Nicolas Cage, like, does a whole lot of movies for a paycheck, and I kind of get it. It makes sense. But at a certain point, like, like, dude, man, some shit you just got to pass up, man. I'm serious. And on top of that, Nicolas Cage trying to battle with swords. Dude. Dude, it's pitiful. <laughs> dude, it's really bad. Oh, man, dude. 
I mean, it reminded me of that jujitsu movie. And if you've ever seen that jujitsu movie, dude, that is terrible. I mean, he fares a little bit better in this than he does in jujitsu, but it's still fucking pitiful, man. I was honestly looking forward to the movie, man. I was. I mean, think about this, guys. I mean, Sofia Boutella is gorgeous, right? Nicolas Cage. I love me some crazy Nicolas Cage. Ain't gonna lie. Love that crazy motherfucker. And Bill Mosley as the bad guy. I mean, seriously. What could possibly go wrong? Damn. Everything? Shit. <laughs> Man, seriously, man. It's just random what the fuckness for random what the fuckness sake. There's no purpose to anything. And at the end of the day, that doesn't make for a cult classic movie. It just makes for a movie that you sit down and say, I just don't understand why this movie exists. I can watch better movies by Nicolas Cage, by Bill Mosley, by Sofia Boutella. This, this doesn't really you know, tickle my fancy the way I was really hoping it would. It had high potential, but once you sit down and watch the movie and after you finish it, the credits, you're literally going to have a look on your face, the same look as I have, like, what the fuck did I just watch? <laughs> Seriously, man. It could have been so much cooler than it is, and it turns into one bland piece of shit. <sighs> Sometimes Nicolas Cage hits it out of the park, and other times, man, he flat out whiffs. And this is a big old fucking whiff. That's for damn sure, man. It really honestly is a big old fucking whiff indeed. Damn shame, man. But, I mean, hey, there is some physical media love this week. Not bad at all. Some interesting stuff to check out. How about we head out? Yep, not bad at the beast this week. Ugh. Oh, shit. Good lord, man. I'm literally blocked in like a motherfucker here. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Oh, lord. The Black Friday craziness. Let me tell you guys, man. Oh, lord. I'm literally blocked in with so much fucking TVs and electronics. Seriously. I can't get out. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, lordy, 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 man. Ah, uh, but they did do their due diligence on physical media this week. Some really nice steely love, the new release love as well, and a few surprises. Not bad at all this week. Not incredibly perfect, but does Best Buy ever really deliver a perfect week every single time? Not exactly, guys. Not a, not 100%, let's put it that way. But hey, I was hoping for some good love for physical media this week, and I definitely got it. Especially pre-Black Friday, when they're setting up all of the craziness and madness still going on. Sometimes physical media isn't always the highest priority, but they definitely still did the love this week, and I greatly appreciate it. I hope you guys do as well. How about we head home, finally, and finish the video? Alright, everybody, that'll do it for the Blu-ray and DVD. Out and about video this week, and... Boy, it turned out rather plentiful, didn't it? Kind of a shocker, I'm not gonna lie. But if you really think about it, shouldn't really be a shocker, considering that a lot of the studios are trying to put out all of these titles before the big holiday times so that they can get them all out to the mass public and they can buy them up like crazy, you know, for holiday shopping and everything. So it shouldn't really surprise me too much, but... So close to Black Friday, I was like, I'm not sure whether we're going to get a lot of stuff, but hey, I'm happy to be wrong. I'm not going to lie, man. Very happy indeed. And boy, this time around, I was quite happy to be wrong because so much physical media came out, guys. I was very happy to show it all off. Hopefully, you were happy to check it all out. If you picked up something good, definitely let me know as far as I'm concerned. I got a few titles, one in store. I got it over at Target, and this one, surprise, surprise, I actually enjoyed so much that I had to buy it. And that is none other than The Eyes of Tammy Faye. Oh my god, seriously, I bought this? Yeah, I did, guys. I loved it that much. I really did, man. And if you were to have told me before I ever watched this thing that I was going to love it that much about these fake 
religious televangelists and the story of their lives, I would have been like, get, get the f*** out of here. <laughs> so seriously? But it's such a fun and entertaining movie that it really engaged me in a way I was not prepared for, man. And what's wild about this movie, what really is wild about it, I mean, yes, a lot of these characters are scumbags. Okay, let's be real here. They truly are. But what really opens my eyes about this movie is the fact of how much they were able to scam people. How gullible people really are. I'm serious, man. I, I mean, the fact that these people created a network that got over 20 million people per day to watch their stuff. And they were always going out of their way to say, well, we need more money for this and we need more money for that. And they would they would just air out their grievances and their personal problems on the network just to get money from people. And people ate it up. People bought into this shit and they gave these people so much money. And the amount that these people are scam artists just shocks me, man. But... They're only as big of con artists as they are is because people bought into it. I mean, people like Pat Robertson and Jerry Falwell and these people, you know, they exploit something. They exploit this religious need that these people have and they just use it for monetary purposes. And it's the same thing of you going into church, right? Like, you go into church and they say, well, the, the more you give to the Lord, the, the, the better you're going to be saved, or whatever kind of bullshit it is. And that should never be the case, guys. I mean, seriously, God should not be worried about how much money you give to the church or give to a televangelist. God, well, what does God care how much you give to them? They, they don't care. Religion has been so twisted and turned around over the years and it's people like these people that really exploited it. And you got to give them credit because they exploited it in a really successful way. I mean, they took the idea of religion and, you know, obviously the church and, you know, all of these prayers and everything that could in some ways be mundane. And they turned it into something incredibly entertaining and accessible and they profited off of that. And that is just wild to me. The fact that people were that gullible to buy into this shit just tells me that, you know what, man, if you wrap it up in a nice, neat little package, and if you're able to sell it to the right people, you will make money. And this is proof positive of it. I hate to say that it's going on to this day. I'd like to say that it's a thing of the past, but it's really not. We're still gullible to this day. We still buy into a lot of bullshit. And unfortunately, people are still profiting off of it in a big, bad way, man. So this is not nothing new. It's not nothing old. It continues to happen, and it's been happening for decades. But it's just a wild story. So entertaining. The acting is amazing here, and I fully had fun with this movie. And I had to have it in the collection, man. So, so damn good well worth the purchase. And the next title, well, I got it through a little Orbit DVD love from Mill Creek, and that is none other than Splitting Airs. Oh, man, Splitting Airs. Damn, do you remember this one? Jeez, God, what a blast from the past, dude. Such a really great comedy, man. I love it. And it came into this sort of VHS slipcover look. With the inside art as well. Definitely dig that art, man. That is great, man. I mean, so many great people here. Rick Moranis, Eric Idle, Barbara Hershey, Catherine Zeta-Jones. A young Catherine Zeta-Jones, man. John Cleese is in here as well. Oh, my God. So good, dude. I, I actually watched this way, way back in the day. Like, the VHS days I watched this, guys. This was so fun to me. And... I sort of forgot about it over the years because it's not exactly like a high-profile film. Like when you think of Don Cleese or Rick Moranis or Eric Idle, this is not exactly the movie that people think about, right? It's very low on the totem pole, highly underrated, but really fun. Basically, it's just this movie about 
mistaken identity and these two babies getting switched up and one who is the real heir to this throne and the other one who you know isn't and it's just this really dumb shit <laughs> and and is trying to reclaim the throne and all the wacky hijinks that happen it is fun man it's really really great i love this movie so much wacky ridiculous over the top but damn do i love this man and it's just movies like this that I just really miss Rick Moranis, man. I mean, I know he's not dead, obviously, and he's still doing stuff from time to time, but, man, I really miss the days when Rick Moranis was Rick Moranis, man. He was really out there doing some really great work, and, God, I just miss him so much. I, I really do, dude. This, this movie is great. Highly underrated, very much overlooked, but really, really fun, man. I thought I never actually owned this, on any format ever to actually put in the collection, but there you go. Hey, I'm happy. Don't get me wrong. This is a movie that definitely needs to be watched. Fun as hell and well worth the collection. Oh, indeed it is, baby. But that is not all because I got one more thing and it came from Second Sight. I picked this up. I've been wanting to pick it up for a while, mind you, but I finally pulled the trigger on it and that is none other than Flight. Of the Navigator, baby. Yes, the second sight release of Flight of the Navigator. Oh, yeah. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Straight off the bat, I can hear it already. Wait a minute. You didn't get the Disney Movie Club exclusive? You got the second sight release? Okay, here's the thing. I love Disney Movie Club. I think they do a fantastic job with their releases. Absolutely, 100%, man. But they don't really put any effort into special features or some of the artwork you name it and i knew that this version was out there i didn't know it was out there and on a whim i said before i order it from disney movie club because i was really highly considering it i said let me go on second sight films website and see if they have it just in stock if they don't hey i'll order through disney movie club it's all good they had copies and I was like instead of going with the Disney movie Club version I'm going with second sight release and baby and boy am I so glad I mean the artwork is so cool man I love the artwork so so much and this is such a fun 80s space adventure movie I just love it man with the quirky uh creatures and the designs of the ship is it's not exactly the most memorable one but it reminds me of like a lot of those old school ones from back in the day, like like a space camp or something like like that, right? I mean, it's it's not the most impressive thing of all time, but it's just really really fun. And if you're somebody like me that watched it when they're they were a kid, then this is all types of nostalgia. And I've been wanting it for a really long time, and I've just kind of been holding off. There's been other things to get. And I've just been like, okay, I'll pick it up at some point. And now I figure now's the time to pull the trigger. And I'm so glad that I did, man. Great. Yes, it's from the UK. But as I always tell you guys, you guys got to get a region free player. I mean, seriously, there are so many really great overseas releases that really beg to be owned by physical media collectors. It really does. And by now, if you're not invested in a region free player, you really need to be, man. It's, it's releases like this that I'm so glad. And the special features are incredibly plentiful here. I mean, you have a bunch of featurettes. You have audio commentaries. You name it. I mean, it's it's fantastic special features. And Second Sight puts a lot of love into the releases. How it came with the black case as well, which looks so sweet. I am very thankful that I picked up this edition. No doubt. I've always wanted the movie. And now I finally have it in the collection and damn glad for it with a really, really great release. Can't say that if you picked up the Disney Movie Club version that it's a bad release because it's not. But if you're lucky to get this release, damn worth it. That is for sure, man. And my God, look at this. Love, baby. Uh, old school forgotten comedies, 80s sci-fi goodness, and a little televangelist love. Sure, why not, man? Definitely was experiencing all the varieties this week. And before I let you guys go, I gotta talk about this very interesting article that I found through Facebook. 
as the DVD turns 25 years old. My God, man, 25 years old, huh? Hmm. Why people still love collecting them, even with a shelf life. Let's dive in, shall we? Cameron Spurwell has been collecting DVDs since 2001. And even after years of adding to his growing stockpile, he still remembers the first two he and his family rented. After buying a brand new DVD player, the family brought home rentals of The Majestic and Summer Catch. My sister and I sat and we were like, special features? Behind the scenes? That's how they make movies? <laughs> Wild, huh? It was a surreal thing because you all of a sudden had more to do with the DVD than you did with the VHS. DVDs or digital video discs were first introduced in Japan in November 1996. Man, that is a blast from the frickin' past, man. Meaning they've now been in production for over 25 years. And while many have moved on, first to Blu-ray discs and now to streaming accounts, some still hold tight to their favorite DVDs. But will these this last the test of time? According to a research published by the Canadian Conservation Institute in 2010 and revised in 2019, the average lifespan of a DVD or Blu-ray is between 10 to 20 years old, suggesting the older titles in your library could start to fail. Could. May not. But could. You never know. Spurwell, who has a particular fondness for teen slasher films, points out that not every title he collects is available to stream. I've got movies on DVD that aren't even made into DVDs anymore. And uh, movies people often forget about. A lot of these cult classic 90s movies that you might have watched once in 1997 and completely forgot about it ever since. When the TV series After the Last Airbender was first removed from a streaming service a few years ago, DVD collector Ram San said it made him realize the value of physical media. I just got fed up with the fact that something, even though it is available anywhere, kind of almost has an expiration date to it because of licensing. It just made sense to have a physical copy in my hand. Indeed, it does pay off. Ain't no lie, it definitely, definitely pays off, guys. Oh my god, 25 years. Can you believe that shit? Man! And the fact that DVDs are still going strong to this day. Think about it. If you really look at the, the formats that are still selling really well, DVD is among the top of them. Seriously. And I know a lot of people have ended up wondering why isn't 4K more accessible and why is that more powerful than than dvd is or, or why isn't blu-ray really catching on fire as much as we would think it is but there's a certain charm and value to dvds that i think is still worth it for many collectors out there i really do i don't buy as many dvds as i used to buy trust me Guys, I used to have a collection of over 5,000 movies, majority of them being DVDs. I used to work at Media Play years and years and years ago, and we got a discount. And when the first DVDs were coming in, man, I was just hoarding that shit up like you wouldn't believe, man. I was gobbling that crap, man. And I just loved it. And I think a lot of people did because it was so new, it was so revolutionary, and again, special features. The idea of seeing the behind the scenes, seeing the interviews, seeing deleted scenes. There, there was something about it that was like you were, you were looking into a window that you weren't supposed to be looking into. And you got to see the other side of it. And that was so cool, man. And obviously, times have changed. Things have moved on. We've went to Blu-ray. We've had the whole thing with the HDVD, Blu-ray war. We've now had 4K. There's talk of 8K. But yet, DVDs are still popular. And I think number one is the price. Because, not gonna lie, as much as I like 4K at times, the price can get a little over-ridiculous. I also think sometimes with these boutique labels, a lot of times... They upcharge like a motherfucker, and I think a lot of people wait for a DVD to come out so that 
they're able to pay less money for it and a lot of people really have not ever upgraded to another format there's a lot of people out there that still depend on dvd to this day and i know that seems ridiculous but a lot of people just never really decided to switch to go to another format i think it was always the nostalgia of it i think it was also the fact that it was just a format that they grew up with really loving and it's something that is still dependable for them and they don't see any reason to upgrade and that's understandable a lot of people get pissed off about people still collecting dvds they get pissed off about it well why are they doing that i mean why can't they upgrade to more proper format a better format out there but sometimes it's just a simple idea that they just don't want to do it guys i mean that's, that's the honest to god truth man and there's nothing wrong with collecting just dvds there's nothing ever wrong with it. And if anybody tells you that there's something wrong with you for collecting only DVDs and why aren't you going for Blu-ray or 4K, those people can fuck off. And I'm serious. All of those people out there that tell you that DVDs are worthless, that uh, 4K is the better way to go, those people are full of shit, okay? I'm not always buying everything 4K. Then again, I'm not always buying everything Blu-ray Blu either. There's certain films then I know that are only going to come out on DVD, and that's the format that I buy. I have no shame in buying DVDs. I just don't buy them a lot. But I don't mind still buying them from time to time. There's ones out there that I still have DVDs of that I've never upgraded to Blu-ray and 4K. I've never done it, and I never will. Certain ones where I like the packaging, I like the artwork, I like the features, and... The many times that some of those releases have been ported over, we've lost features. We've lost that certain sense of original artwork that the DVDs definitely had. And also, it's kind of interesting because with each iteration going forward within another format, we've also had issues with picture quality. We've had issues with color timing. And sometimes a lot of people say, well, the color timing is a little wrong. It was much better on the DVD and so on and so forth. And for some reason, every upgrade, there seems to be some problem that happens one way or another. So there's a certain amount of purity with the DVDs that as time went on is not so much there anymore. I'm not entirely, but to a certain degree, yes. And as I said in the article with that one guy who was like, hey, I wanted to watch Avatar The Last Airbender. And it was on this streaming site, but because of licensing issues, it got taken off. I couldn't watch it. But you know what I could watch it on? I could watch it on physical media. And there's something really great about that. To have it in a format where you know you're never going to be able to worry about any licensing issues or getting taken off of a streaming site or altered or changed. And there's something about preserving that. I mean, even that one guy ends up saying, look, there's a lot of really great old school, even 90s movies out there that have never been put on any kind of other format other than DVD. Not only can you not find it on streaming services, but you can't even find it on Blu-ray or even 4K at that. I mean, think about this for a second, guys. On VHS, there were so many movies that got put on VHS, right? Huge, huge, gigantic amount, man. And then the transition from VHS to DVD, there was a huge amount that got ported over. Not everything, but a huge, gigantic amount that did. Then the transition from DVD to Blu-ray, even lesser amount got transferred over, right? Not as many from VHS to DVD got transferred over from DVD to Blu-ray. And then even less than that got transferred over from Blu-ray to 4K. And yes, there will always be those big titles that will always get transferred over, right? The Godfathers, The Wizard of Oz, is, Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, you name it, they're always going to get transferred over, right? But what about the lesser, obscure, unknown ones out there, the underappreciated ones? 
they're not always going to get a chance to get ported over. I mean, some eventually will, but it's going to take a long ass time before that really ever happens, man. And that's a real damn shame. It really honestly is. And there's something about the the DVD format that has been good in preserving these unknown, underrated, obscure oddities out there that you can't find on a Blu-ray or a 4K. And that's another reason why I think DVD has lasted as long as it has, because a lot of these ones out there have never gotten the chance to shine on any other format and has only been seen through DVD. And so there is a certain amount of preserving preserving media out there that might not be for the masses, but might be for the cult fans out there. And that's really important because a lot of these movies, if the DVDs were gone, you'd never find them again. And so DVDs have become very important, not only in the fact of old school nostalgia, but the fact of a lot of these movies We'll never see the light of day on a Blu-ray. We'll never see the light of day on a 4K disc. And it's only through the DVD format that they're even able to survive. And so, there's, as I said, there's a certain amount of preservation of that that you really do have to appreciate. And as I've always said, man, at the end of the day, movies deserve a chance. Movies deserve an opportunity. And... We're living in a world now that is so fast-paced, that is so willing to go from the next thing to the next thing, and everything is so easily digestible, and if it's a day or two old, it's immediately forgotten about. And we don't have a patience for for actually remembering things anymore we're on to the next thing immediately as as it's happening and that's a shame because it means to me that we're never able to really take time anymore to appreciate what we have or what we used to have and what's great about physical media collectors about you guys out there about me is that we love cinema we preserve movies we value movies and we want to end up remembering them and physical media is the way to do that and sometimes old school physical media is the way to keep it going and sometimes dvd is the best option out there look I'm all for exploring new paths when it comes to physical media. I'm always willing to see where the next great inventions will come from. You know, where will 8K take us? And 4K is still growing to this day. How Blu-ray is still bl blossoming. There's so many great things ahead for physical media, but you got to remember that sometimes you have to look back in order to, to appreciate where we are now. And sometimes in order to do that, you know, sometimes it's worth going back and maybe rebuying some old school DVD, some old school stuff that maybe you forgot about. I mean, nowadays, I think it's worth it to appreciate the old school stuff. And seeing DVD turn 25 years old, 25 years, man, that is wild to me. My God, man, that is... <laughs> That is literally over half of my life that DVDs have been around. That's nuts. And I really hope that DVD lasts another 25 years. I, I really do, man. I mean, when everybody has counted DVD out, and I remember when I had friends who like 10 years ago said, oh, five years from now, DVDs are gone, they're extinct. And you wanna know what, they're still here. They're still, every time I go into the store, seeing new releases, they're right there. You know, newer TV shows are still on DVD, newer releases are, big studios are still diving into because they make money and it's still something worth investing in. 
So never count out physical media. Never count out old school physical media. Because just when you think that you count it out, it comes back yet again, man. And it just shows the power and the longevity of physical media. And the fact that if we... If, if we really do love movies and love a lot of our entertainment out there, then physical media is really the way to go. And it doesn't matter what you collect, man. It doesn't matter DVD, 4K, Blu-ray. doesn't matter any of that stuff, guys. As long as you collect, as long as you have a love for cinema, as long as, as, long as you show it off, that's what matters. And so DVD is still appreciated in my eyes. And, you know, even with newer technology coming down the pike, it just shows that that the old school media can sometimes still be the most effective media out there. So don't count it out. Don't shrug it off. Appreciate it because it definitely deserves to be appreciated. Right? Well, I want to know what you guys think about that. I love physical media in any type of format possible. And the fact that DVDs are, has been 25 years and going strong, that does say something, now, doesn't it? I'd like to think it does, guys. But definitely let me know what you think about that. Hopefully, you also enjoyed this video. If you did, definitely give it the thumbs up. Hopefully, you enjoyed it. If you did, as I said, the thumbs up. Definitely subscribe to the channel if you have not. If you love movies, physical media, become a fan of the Film Fan Nation. I want to thank my really great subscribers out there. You guys give me great feedback, watch the videos, you know, great comments. I really appreciate it. If you love what I do and haven't subscribed yet, definitely do that. Also, hit the notification bell if you haven't. It will notify you every single time that I make a video. Keep up to date with everything I'm doing through Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Film Fan went away. Keep up to date with everything I'm doing, plus special pictures and videos I do from time to time on social media as well. And if you want to send the channel any movie-related goodness, you can do it. Movie posters, care packages, physical media, you name it. It is not expected, but it is definitely appreciated. I re-up for another six months, not too long ago. So I have the P.O. Box at least for yet another six months. Could be longer. Who knows? But I know a lot of you guys have been out there and really been like, hey, I've been interested in sending you something and where to send it. The P.O. Box is definitely to do that. The P.O. Box is in the description below. I've got some amazing stuff from you guys so far, and I cannot wait to see where the P.O. Box Avengers take me next. So if you are interested, definitely send the channel a little love. And... I guess that'll do it for the out and about this week, guys. Pretty damn sweet, dare I say. And hopefully more great titles ahead. So I guess I'll see you back next time for a brand new Blu-ray DVD out and about video. Take care, everybody, and happy hunting.